All right, guys, welcome to The WAN Show. This time with audio, we've got a fantastic show for you today, um, which starts with having sound. It looks like our mixer was unplugged, so hopefully that is all completely taken care of. That's not my fault. Good, You're the one that unplugged it. Good job on Don't the Don't look at me. I, did, I mean, I didn't unplug Maybe if you hadn't broken the connector. I didn't. It wouldn't get... It's not broken. Well, look at it. It doesn't work very After well. After the show, go look at it. It's not broken. This is designed that way. All right, well, at any rate, guys, we have a fantastic show for you today. Our guest is the one and only Total Biscuit. If you have heard of Total Biscuit, that's great. Then be stoked. He'll be joining us in about 25 minutes. If you haven't heard of Total Biscuit, then you'll meet him here, or I guess you could just Google him. He's kind of a big deal, so yeah, there's that. Um, Valve is showing off. I guess they, they had to do something because uh, the general internet sentiment about their upcoming controller was... Was not super positive. <laughs> Kind of everyone was looking at me going, are you guys high? Um, so they've actually got a demo. We're going to check that out a little bit later. 50% of Steam users, this is crazy. So oh, yeah. we are finally moving forward in terms of minimum specification requirements. 50% of Steam users are not going to be able to play some of the upcoming AAA game titles. So, I, I mean, more discussion on that, yeah. of course, when that actually happens in the show. The GPU wars rage on, just in general. We have news on each side of each side attacking, basically. And then uh, T-Mobile unlimited data roaming in 100 countries, I think. Which yeah. is like 95% of where people are going to be traveling. I mean, that is such a game changer. Guys, that's that is so not, beast. that's not like, it's not quite, I mean, it's tech, but it's not tech. It's more like business. But we are definitely going to be getting into that. What an enormously huge deal that is. Yeah. So without further ado, let's get this going. Because I I I have had enough difficulty today. What happened? Just give it a sec. Don't worry. We got this. take a moment to thank our sponsor Squarespace for sponsoring the show today. They have been phenomenally generous with the WAN show over the last few months actually guys so if you want to take advantage of a special deal unfortunately we don't have the same one as last month with 20% off of, uh, of your first sort of your first paid uh, membership. I'm sorry I'm a little bit <laughs> I forgot to put the lower third that has the offer code on it. Anyway, last oh. month was 20% off. This month is 10% off. So Squarespace is the easy way to create a professional looking website that works not only on desktop, but also on tablets and phones and all kinds of cool stuff. It's a turnkey solution. So they handle the hosting for you and they even dynamically can add uh, additional load capabilities, which we tested with our site when we had the entire live stream hit it a few weeks ago. Yeah. So there you guys go. Squarespace.com slash Linus and the offer code is Linus10 for this month. So without further ado, let's uh, let's kick into our first topic before our guest joins us. And I mean, we've actually got a lot of uh, gaming topics this week. Ugh, wrong way. What do you want? Wrong way. I, I don't know what you want. Right there. <laughs> That's really? our actual first topic. You're going to kick off with that. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, guns blazing. Guns right. blazing. Literally. You're going <laughs> to kick off with ECS launches... Oh, yeah. All right, Lee, guns gank drones, gaming, ECS launches, oh, yes. and this right. is the guns kind of thing blazing. that, um, you know what, I think you feel a little stronger about this than I do, so why don't you go ahead and do it, do it. Gank drone, when there's, like, stuff in the news constantly about, like, drone strikes and drones flying across the states. Gank drone, when there's, like, stuff in the news constantly about, like, drones drones killing people and people like drones. Okay, so it's not the most tactful, tactful title. I mean, you called it gank drone. It's not the worst title. Marketing ECS has ever done. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, do you remember their Black Series boards? Do you remember what the tagline for those boards was? I mean, do you remember their Black Series boards? Go on Black Adventure, get amazing treasure, or something like that. And I was just like, so basically, they're saying once you go black, you never go back. Oh like, my god. Well, no, really. I mean, I, you read something like that. Oh. And you, no, I hear you. But I mean, they like... had an entire micro site that nobody proofread, obviously. <laughs> Obviously nobody. Apparently we've got. Oh, for crying out loud! What? Stream echo. Okay, it should be gone. Are you now. watching it? Well, I wasn't. You're watching it. No, no, no. That one's fine. That one's fine. That one's fine. Okay, that one's muted. 
Okay, all right, we should be all good. Um, so the uh, so back to the back to the gank drone. Okay, well for me the problem with this has has as much to do with that as to the fact that they're doing it wrong. I mean they're calling it leet, but look at the spelling. L three three seven. Yeah, that drove me kind of crazy too. I mean it's one thing. To, I mean okay, so they're taking leet speak and they're applying grammatical correctness to it. It's like well this is the name of a product line, so it should be capitalized. Well, and they didn't put a one. Yeah, I know. But that's uh, okay. like, that's, yeah. L is a technically a capital one, right? Oh, no. Right? I don't know. No? I mean, I don't know what they're thinking about it. Oh, my God. So, I, okay, so there's the color scheme for the board. You know what? Honestly, it's pretty unexceptional looking. It's not like we've never seen an orangey color scheme before. I mean, it's not even really gold, to be to be perfectly honest. When you compare this... To, um, the two spots look gold and the caps look gold, but I mean, the, but the big heat sinks don't look. What is this? What is this plate right here? I know between the CPU <laughs> socket and the RAM. Like what is this is supposed like, to do? Is it taller than some minimal height RAM? It looks like it's about the same height as your memory. Like they're okay, probably yeah. marketing it as like a heat shield or something. Well, because I was wondering if it might uh, interfere. Because I thought it might be. I can't really tell if it interferes with coolers. That would be hilarious. I mean, it looks like it looks like more of like an airflow shield to me. And this looks yeah. like an extremely inexpensive board. I mean, you look at it, you can usually tell just looking at a board. There, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of components on it. No. <laughs> You know, where, where's the beefy VRM? Um, you know, where's the right angle SATA ports? It looks like this is really marketed to, um, well, you know, 12 year olds asking their parents for a new gaming machine. And, you know, oh, it's called the Gank Drone. So, and it's like gold and stuff. So it must be awesome. Um, I mean, I try not to talk smack about anyone, but the cold hard truth of it is, guys, I can't think of a compelling reason to buy an ECS motherboard. <laughs> Call me wrong. <laughs> I mean, people people message me all the time, oh, and they're they're like, Linus, why why haven't you done an unboxing of this brand, this or this other thing? And I often don't know what to say because I can't I can't publicly say well because they don't make anything that has any value. Um, I can't say that. That's just rude. And ECS is not one of those. They have <laughs> a compelling value in certain price segments and certain product <clears throat> bands. So, for example, they have their, their low-end products do incredibly well in some developing markets like mm -hmm. South America. This is true. This I know. But a gaming motherboard? I covered their... We need like a cricket sound effect that I can... <laughs> we need to be more like a radio show. And we should have like a soundboard that I can just... I covered their booth at Computex, and when going through it, I knew no one would care about the business sector motherboards that they have, so I didn't bother to cover them, but, but that was the interesting part. Yes, they're an OEM. I covered the gaming section motherboards as fast as I possibly could. I went through them as fast as I could, and then jumped right to the other side of the booth where they had like their featured builds, which looked really I cool. mean, the problem, the problem with it is that gaming motherboard customers ask for very particular things that rely on moving an inordinate volume of boards in order to put the R&D resources required into, into delivering those things uh, in order to even achieve that. And if you're moving sort of a few hundred of something or a few thousand of something even, you can't afford to put the work in that someone like Asus does with an ROG board, knowing that they're going to sell boatloads of them. And even if they don't, they're going to sell boatloads of other high margin motherboards that they can then funnel that funding into making sure that they have a halo level product that makes them look good in the yep. market. So, um, so there you go, the, the, the puke drone or gank drone or whatever. I mean, speaking of Asus, that doesn't mean that they're getting a pass on the whole golden motherboard thing. No. Because, I mean, I mean, at least Asus has the sway to come out and make Corsair deliver gold memory to match. <laughs> Which, I mean, you look at it and you're like, Corsair, why do you have that gold memory? They're like, well, customers want, you know, um, mem matching, you know, color schemes for their systems. And there's, you know, some gold motherboards on the market. <laughs> like, really? I wonder what those are. Who made those ones? <laughs>
Yes, that's true. But the, yeah, I'm still that. Yeah, like you said, it doesn't give them a pass either. Um, no, not at all. All right, what do we want to talk about next? Did you put this in a particular order? I didn't have much to do with the planning doc I this week. I kind of did, but we can jump down a little bit just because I think that topic might take a little bit too long and sure. we're slightly behind schedule. So if we want to jump down to Chrome OS's takeover of Windows, ah quote yes, quote unquote takeover. All right, guys, check this out. So you so, go ahead. So basically, as far as I could get out of it, it's like. It's kind of a little bit vague, to be completely oh. honest. Posted by Good Bytes on the forum, original article from The Verge, just throwing that out there. But, um, and like, Good Bytes' little bit about it seems slightly sensational. Yeah, it's a little bit biased, man. Um, it's, <laughs> if you jump over to The Verge, Verge's article, it doesn't really take over Windows. It's an application, and as you run the application, it then basically does, while you're running the application, a takeover of Windows. But it doesn't actually take over Windows. So instead of just being a browser, you jump into like the Google suite ecosystem, and then it takes over the start menu while you're in there, and then that start menu becomes for Google apps. Yeah, and what, the, and, and your apps that you get from the Play Store. Or and whatnot. given that Windows 8 didn't have much of a start menu to speak of anyway, I guess if Google wants to put their own start menu in there, that's great. I, I think for me, I just don't see this happening. Web connectivity, yes, is a big deal, but I would see someone that's much better established like Linux taking over as opposed to... I'm not ready to run a lightweight OS that relies on internet connectivity. And, and this isn't a lightweight OS because it has to sit on top of Windows. That and it's, I mean, it's Chrome. And if, if you're going to, if we want to talk lightweight, I mean, back when Chrome launched, their whole thing was lightweight browser. It is anything but lightweight it's now. Lightweight if anything, browser. the memory utilization of Chrome is... One, is the worst thing about my system. It's the only reason I need more RAM these days. People, Firefox people were harping on either, you but... last week saying that you had too many tabs open, but the Chrome that was crashing was actually the one that was on the desktop, not his laptop. So his laptop had 10 billion tabs open and was stable. We're not saying that was the problem. It was the Chrome on the desktop that had like four tabs open. <laughs> that, it was just, that was just not working for like two hours. Crashing just because. Our stream computer is kind of funny and unstable. Yes. I mean, okay, so... Google's agenda here is Chrome applications. Yep. So you understand why they would want people to, to, to run Chrome as not just a browser, but as something that overlays your entire desktop experience. And I can see the value add there. I can, because for me, having something like Google Hangouts is a great example of Google, if you're watching, yeah, we still need desktop applications for things. Running inside of Gmail inside of my browser or inside Google Plus is ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. For anyone that is actually anything beyond a very casual user, you it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it had, had, multiple mul people who are using multiple monitors, okay, maybe you have a dedicated like Gmail app, but you know what? You know what happens with Hangouts? Oh, it covers all of your UI elements that you need. How am I supposed to trash that draft I'm working on? I guess I could close all of my Hangout chats. It's ridiculous. I mean, the fact that they think we don't need a dedicated desktop application for it, or they haven't been arsed to work on it, and they're still forcing us to integrate into Hangouts and all these other things that they're doing, guys, it's not ready yet. Maybe I'm just mad because I can't use Skype anymore because it's a big pile of crap. And <laughs> I mean, there is no clear replacement. Microsoft, bring back MSN, please. If you're watching, Bring back MSN, please, because it was the only thing that actually worked. It had video chat that actually worked without cause all kinds of exploits causing all kinds of trouble. It had easy file transfers. It had IM that actually worked. Um, I, when when anyway. we finally figured out, like, yeah, okay, we just actually can't use Skype at all, ever. Um, I was searching for other things, and something that popped into my mind was like, oh, MSN. I was like, oh, wait. You know what? The service is still running. If I hadn't integrated my Skype account with my MSN account, or Windows Live account, whatever you want to call it, um, I would still be able to use it today. And a lot oh. of people I know are still on there. I oh, mean, it, and that integration never worked correctly. Like, it never worked correctly. And this is why I'm so mad about Google's move, integrating Google Plus with YouTube, because integrating accounts, merging accounts, if anything, Google has one of the worst track records I've ever seen, and that's with my personal experience as a YouTuber, watching the way that YouTube and Google have gradually become more and more enmeshed. All kinds of things are broken to this day, and there's all kinds of legacy crap that is just fundamentally flawed. I mean, things like 
joining accounts together and then not being able to separate them. That's the biggest problem. Because if I could guess and check, if I could try things and then and then I, I and then I could undo them if it didn't work, then that'd be great. But they've done it to me too many times where I can't undo it. Now it's fundamentally broken. Contacting their support does absolutely nothing, and it's extremely frustrating. There's no documentation for the whole thing because Google's an engineering company, not a customer service company. So. Okay, you know what? I, I liked the old Google that would like bucket toss out applications and just be like, here, here's a whole bunch of really well written, really awesome stuff. Use it if you want and make a new account for it and you're good to go. Now it seems like they're pulling back how many applications they have, forcing people to use them all together in one big thing and generally becoming much more closed off, which I'm not into any of those things. Someone wants to know if uh, Slick has a tattoo on his arm. No, no, that would be a bruise. Yes. You want to hold it up? For... There you go. Bruise or hickey, depending on it's what your theory a, happens a... to be. Okay, so <sighs> the th want to talk about the future of news? It's, now I want to talk about the bruise on my arm so people don't think it's a freaking hickey. All right, let's talk about the uh, future of news. <laughs> So, guys, um, I mean, who would have expected me to ever say that Fox is the future of news? <laughs> oh, the irony. <laughs> the past of news. <laughs> the past of, this should never have existed of news. It looks like a joke. <laughs> I know. It looks, I mean, the thing about this is it looks like oh, a man. meme before people <laughs> even start turning it into memes. So Fox has introduced 55, what are effectively 55 inch tablets into their newsroom. Um, which they call bats. Which they call bats. What does that stand for? Big ass TVs? No, big, big area touchscreens. Big area touchscreens. Okay. So, I mean, they even sound like guns that people are sitting there firing. I mean, <laughs> arm the bats. Uh, I mean, there's, so there's a few problems with this. Number one is that it looks ridiculous. Uh, it looks it looks like you're trying too hard to be the Starship Enterprise. Number two is pixel density. <laughs> you ca you cannot simply make a usage model or a user experience better. You can't enhance it simply by enlarging screen size. If that were possible, PC monitors wouldn't have hit that maximum that they've hit. They've hit a maximum. For so long, what we were trying to do was every generation of monitor technology was, holy crap, we made it bigger. And TVs even to a certain extent. I mean, every year at CES, Sony and Samsung, LG, all those guys are showing off bigger TVs. None of that ever makes it to market. No. Because nobody wants a 100-inch TV. Or, I mean, maybe they want it. No one has anywhere to put that. It's the same with monitors. Your desk is only so big, and the way that you interact with something that you're doing real work on is going to not necessarily be enhanced by being bigger. We it's need like... more pixel ah. density. <laughs> and they didn't even manage to make them more than full HD. These are 1080p, 55-inch <laughs> screens. So picture that. Let's go back to this image for a moment here. So put yourself that close to your monitor. Okay, so it's about like holding my face here in terms of like what I can actually see at a time. Text is going to look terrible, absolutely terrible. You're, 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 it's not like you can actually make use of the size because you don't have any real estate in terms of the pixels. It's like if you examine the pixels, you'd see that all those memes out there are clearly photoshops and this one is actually the original. I've seen some great ones though, like ones with like space and behind them, Oompa Loompas <laughs> manning all the stations and like... I, I love his photo wall thing too. He has a 38 foot photo wall. Yeah. And okay, he can so just that... like move stuff around. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> like what? Why? And we wonder why traditional media is dying. <laughs> Because they don't get it. Because everyone else on every other medium can have Twitter and doesn't need a 55-inch touchscreen. I mean, this is how we do Twitter. It's like, uh. Well, okay, you're looking at our broadcaster dashboard right now, but, 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 but we're using, like, an old monitor that, like, we had lying around and we put the Twitters on it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what's actually necessary. So... Yeah, we got, we got a bit of a kick out of that. You know what? Why don't we do one more topic before we have uh, before we have our special guest, Total Biscuit, for those of you who don't know who our guest is today. He's ready to go whenever, but this, yeah, this shouldn't Should be Should we hit this long. one? All right. So, NVIDIA, I'm, I'm going to end up ranting again. You know what? Let's not do this right now. Okay.
I, I'm I'm not I'm not ready yet. Should we just pull him up? You know what? Why don't Why don't we do that? Why don't we uh, Why don't we invite Total Biscuit to the show? I'm gonna go ahead and throw our guest lower third on here. Go ahead and throw my uh, headphones on. These are hooked up to something, right? Yep. Okay. I'm tr I'm trusting this guy to you know make sure the show is ready to rock. <laughs> I'm gonna head over to the uh, Twitch chat chat really briefly here. See how excited you guys are. Oh wow. Okay, so the Twitch chat's basically exploding. So there's a there's a healthy mix of my wow, I'm I I'm ready to die now because, you know, my life is perfect now. And uh and then a fair bit of uh no, not this guy. So I think probably our first <laughs> our first topic for you is going to be you're a bit of a polarizing character. You've been working on changing your approach to dealing with fans. How's that going for you? Well, let's just say the ideas are much easier to create than the implementation of those ideas. <laughs> and you're talking about kind of the wholesale reinvention of the way that you interact with people online, which is something that I'm sure we've all developed over the course of over a decade now. And it's difficult to get out of the spot where you really want to get into it with someone you see someone that disagrees <laughs> with you or more importantly someone that like says something about you that's not true on the internet you no wanna, less you want on the internet yeah <laughs> they're telling lies about you on the internet i mean is there a worse crime <laughs> uh, tell me that <laughs> I, so it's it's it is difficult i gotta say it's difficult to deal with and i think if you want to really change your way that you interact with people i'm not even just talking about fans i'm talking about the people that just actively dislike you or post terrible stuff on the internet about you it requires an amount of discipline that i don't think i've developed yet <laughs> <laughs> well that's fantastic you know what i think that's a perfect opening segment here for you two for the half dozen people who are watching our show and who have never heard of you before please introduce yourself and, uh... All right, my name is John Bain in real life. I am better known as Total Biscuit or Cynical Brit on YouTube. And I probably the best way to describe my line of work would be I am a game critic. Okay, so game critic wise, um, you know, I think you probably one of your most popular segments is WTF is you want to tell us a little bit about that before we get into some of these awesome discussion topics we have here? Yeah, it's a format that I stole from Giant Bomb, and it's worked pretty well for me so far. It's the idea of taking a game, playing some of it, and then giving essentially a live first impressions with a focus on analyzing whether or not the game's any good, taking the mechanics apart, looking at the options menu that's available for PC gamers, and then coming to a conclusion as to whether or not it's worth your time. All right, now tell me this. Um, one of the things that you have done in terms of bucking the general, generally conceived to be conventional wisdom is extremely long format videos for the most part. I mean, you go to a, a YouTube run seminar and they'll tell you, well, you've got uh, 15 seconds to capture a viewer. You've got probably a few minutes to keep them engaged, but your engagement, I, I mean, even if you look at it in terms of, well, he's got this many subscribers and this many of the people are actually watching every video and tuning in for 20 minute, 30 minute, 40 minute, even longer content. Um, how, how have you how have you bucked that trend? Well, I don't even believe the trend was there to begin with. I think that it's a trend that came from the idea that the only people that would ever be watching your YouTube videos when you deal with gaming are between 8 and 13 years old. And that's completely false. It's just that a lot of channels aim at that demographic because they're very easy to impress. And they're also very easy to build a rabid fandom out of. You can influence somebody that's still developing they're you know they're a bit young they don't really know what's going on so you'll see these very popular channels that do very well as a result of that but that kind of audience likes a very specific kind of content so if you try and do anything else well good luck getting out of your kind of rut as i suppose as the class clown uh, which is what a lot of these channels are on youtube they're professional court jesters you know they're, they're kind of the village idiot people <laughs> they watch them because like, hey, look at how dumb this guy's acting. You know, <laughs> That's how that kind of thing works. But if you look at the older demographic, these are guys that maybe have jobs where they are at a computer a lot. 
and they want to have something running in the background to listen to as Definitely. they do whatever work they do, or they've got a lot more flexibility, you know, they're in a, a, a senior position where they're just able to spend some time out to watch this kind of stuff. Or maybe they just come home from work and they want to sit down and they want to watch something that's not like a cat that's been fed three pounds of crack and is just bouncing off the walls <laughs> and uh, they want something that's a little bit more laid back a little bit more focused on something and you can get people watching 45 minutes of an hour-long videos my primary demographic is 25 to 32 years old and as a direct result i think that those people are more than willing to watch longer form stuff just as we see a lot of that demographics also willing to watch to watch longer form tv shows now and is willing to sit down for a day and watch like an entire season of a show <laughs> they will do that if it engages them uh, you know what it's funny you mentioned that because when i when i after i watched the first episode of breaking bad uh which was only a couple weeks ago i'm on season five now just to give you guys some idea how addicted i've been i i looked back at the runtime not having realized that it was about an hour long and not an hour long with commercial breaks baked in that i didn't have to watch it's an hour long show and i just looked at it yeah. and i was like oh shit because I am going, this is going to consume my life over the next little while, but that doesn't mean that we can't do it. Now, before we move any, before we move on, I actually, this ties in really well into one of the other topics, and this is something that I get a lot, and I'm sure you get a ton of, is how to become X, how to become a YouTuber, how to become a game critic, where the perception seems to be that we get paid to sit and make videos all day. And now, your comment about cats on crack, I think, <laughs> um is interesting and I would like to tie this back to a comment that I got on YouTube uh, the other day from a viewer so someone had said um, you know making YouTube videos is easy to which I replied well I think you'd actually be surprised at how much work goes into this kind of thing behind the scenes and someone replied saying <clears throat> okay except it is easy like PewDiePie he just plays games and has lots of fun doing it and gets millions of views and thousands upon thousands of dollars. Very easy money in my opinion. To which my rebuttal was, well, people seem to think that PewDiePie is either an idiot or a genius. I can't, I can't sit through his comments, so I don't really know which it is, but I suspect it's the latter because there's so much more to it than someone plays games and makes millions of dollars. It's like saying a pro hockey player waves a stick around or an elite chef just puts stuff in a pot and applies heat. There's a lot of hard work and a bit of magic that goes into success on YouTube, and the ones who succeed probably know what they're doing. Would you make the argument that the guys who are appealing to that lowest common denominator do are making easy money? The thing about that is that everybody's doing it and only a tiny fraction of those people are actually successful. You can dislike people like PewDiePie and Markiplier and things like that all you damn well please, but you have to accept the reality that they have built their brand stronger and more enduring than anybody else. Uh, in theory, if you asked me a couple of years ago about someone like PewDiePie coming along, I'd have said that guy's going to be a flash in the pan and he's going to disappear very quickly. He is going to crest the wave of some kind of hype train of Minecraft some kind of trend. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. same with a lot of people said about the Yogscast. Well, oh, you know, Minecraft's kind of a flash in the pan, so oh, it's yeah. going to be a couple of months worth of popularity and then it'll disappear. People said the same about me when I did WoW, and I was able to transition out of that and continue because at that point I'd built brand strength and I'd built reputation. And that's exactly what people like PewDiePie have actually done. They've built their brand and they've focused more on building their brand than myself, certainly, because I like to let my content speak for me and then he is all about the brand and everyone who watches him is a bro and they're part of this community it's like a it's like a little township of 10 million eight-year-olds you know <laughs> that are all willing to back each other up but but they feel a sense of belonging and for good or ill that actually does help drive that channel forward and yes i'd say that making videos like his is relatively easy in comparison to other things. Uh, if you take a channel that does sketch comedy and spends a week writing the sketch and editing it out and things like that, versus, hey, I'm going to play this game and split it into 20 minute chunks and I'll throw my camera in there and I'll put some little subtitles just to accept the bits that I think are funny. Yeah, that is a lot easier, but I can guarantee he does not do this for one hour a day and then just go and mess around for the rest of the day. Uh, he doesn't. He spends his time building his brand and making deals behind the scenes and continuing to ensure that his channel remains successful. 
And I mean, to me, it's, it's one of those things where I really feel like a lot of detractors who feel like someone doesn't work hard enough um, need to understand better that there's, there's hard work and everyone needs it. And then there's sheer raw talent. I mean, you look at what someone like PewDiePie does and one of the most difficult things about what he does, whether it's time consuming or not, is being on point, being on fire in the way that his audience wants to see him all the time. I had someone criticize me saying, well, all I do is stand there for, you know, seven or eight minutes and talk about a product and, you know, it doesn't take me very long. You know what? You're right. It doesn't take me very long. When I go into, there's a local retailer that we cooperate with that you probably haven't heard of, but most of my viewers know about. When I go into their studio on Friday to shoot content for them, it takes me you know, a tenth as long to make the same video that they would make with one of their other hosts. That has a value to it. It's about more than just how much time it takes me, and I spend a lot of time on other things as well. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about sort of the whole perception of, of selling out as well. I mean, um, I think this is something that you've dealt with a fair bit, and I've certainly dealt yeah, certainly. with a lot. Yeah, and they tie in really nicely together as well. You're talking about the inherent value of a personality, right? Yes. If you have an audience, you have value. As much as people don't like to hear this, I think it's healthy that they know because then they understand the business and they're less likely to get upset at the notion that, yes, people are making money kind of off your back. Viewers are the product. Yeah? They're not the customer. We are not, they are not buying from us. We are selling them to other companies. When you look at, say, the sponsorships that you guys have on your show, yeah, you sell that company your audience. That's the point. And they, they give you money in return. That's how the sponsorship model works. It's actually a very healthy model because it allows all this content to be free. So yes. you don't have to pay a cable subscription. You don't have to pay per view to actually watch our stuff. It's all free. And that inherent value comes from the audience that you've built. It's not necessarily that you went down a mine shaft and did backbreaking work for 14 hours a day. Yeah, <laughs> I, That's not how the world works, guys. I'm sorry. I kind of wish that it was a meritocracy in that respect, that the harder you work, the more you got paid. But it really isn't. And what matters to these companies is how much of an audience that you can gather. And that's where the selling out point comes in, because... Companies want to get at your audience and they want to get at your audience to market their particular product in a way that they feel is best. And they may approach these so-called influencers yeah. as they've, this is a term that's used that's around, the you, know, the, you are an influencer. Yeah. And that's true. You are, you, you have an audience and you have the power to influence them, but you have the power to do so because the audience respects you and they believe what you are saying is true and it hasn't been corrupted. And if you decide that it's a good idea to compromise your opinion, then frankly, you will lose that audience yeah. perhaps sooner rather than later, which is why I find the notion that people think that YouTube personalities regularly sell out because what you're basically saying there is not I'm selling out. What you're saying is I'm selling you guys out because exactly. I was, you know, I'm selling you as the product to the advertiser and I'm willing to suggest that you buy a subpar product because someone is giving me a brown envelope under the table. And I've got to ask you, why on earth would you think that I would do that? How or any respectable YouTuber would do that. How could I do that? Yeah, I mean, it's it, absurd. It's, uh, we okay. need you. It, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't sell you it, out. It's crazy. And the thing, the, the craziest thing about it is imagining that we want this YouTube thing to end. If I wanted yeah. me being a YouTuber and me making a living and building a new business around being a personality that tells people about technology, if I wanted to end that immediately, then I could just start saying that, you know, any expensive thing with lots of margin that people want to give me money to promote. And guys, trust me, I get offered a lot of deals and a lot of money mm -hmm. that I don't take. You can look at my sponsor list. My sponsor list is like Intel. NVIDIA, AMD has been added to that. These are companies where I can, with a straight face, recommend their products, no problem, because I can't afford to lose you guys. I, I, I legitimately need you guys. And uh, yeah, and you got them because you were honest to them in the first place, right? And you're not going to sell them out for a little brown envelope because you'll make more money in the long run by having that audience. And you're right. Why on earth would any of us want to throw this away? We have unprecedented freedom at this point in our lives to produce the kind of media that we want to produce and reach yeah. a large audience, something that was impossible a decade ago. Yeah. It ten, could ten not years be ago, done. I was in high school 
and no guidance counselor could have told me about this. Yep. <laughs> Impossible. And, and like this Absolutely ties true. In, actually to what you guys were talking about earlier with like the not much work goes into it idea is actually both game reviewers and hardware reviewers were two different style of reviewers, but there's a huge amount of research that has to go in for both of us. Uh, Total Biscuit has to know a ton about the game he's reviewing and all the other games in the genre so he can compare it. We have to know about what yep. hardware reviewing and all the other hardware in the genre so that we can compare it. That's a ton of research and actually does take a lot of time. And, yeah, and it's I mean, stuff that you build up over time as well. Yeah. Like that kind of, you have a back catalog of knowledge, essentially, that you use to then learn that. I used to know a lot about hardware years ago when I used to post on the Overclockers forums, and I would keep up to date with everything. And I could be a fairly reliable source around the AMD Mobile Barton era. I could tell you how to overclock <laughs> an AMD Barton, no problem at all. I could tell you how to use an Asus Star Rice and what kind of uh, cooling you would get out of that. But these days, I've completely lost that. And I have really not a lot of hardware knowledge at all beyond the working stuff that I need to build a PC yep. and keep mine running so it doesn't set on fire. And you know <laughs> but what? right now, that is it's a gaming. Great point. It's a great point because people ask me to do game streams in much the same way that they probably ask you for hardware advice. They do, and, yeah. And, and I, I, I say, I'm like, you know what? I, I, I've done it like twice. And you know what? It wasn't very good. I wasn't happy with it. It wasn't entertaining to me. To, to, to listen to myself doing that. And the reason is because I've been out of PC games for a few years to the point where I can look at a game and I could go, hey, this is a great mechanic, not knowing that there was a game released three years ago that innovated that exact same mechanic and did it better. So I'm just gonna look mm -hmm. like an idiot. So I might as well stick to my strength. And that is where my inherent value is to my viewers and to my sponsors as well. Yeah, it's absolutely true. And that value disappears if there is even a moment's hesitation among the viewer base that they believe that your knowledge and your recommendations have been compromised by something anything other than facts in your honest opinion. So I think that sellout is actually a term that gets used incorrectly a lot of the time by viewers. This is yes, a theory I have yep. where they're saying sellout, but what sellout would mean is compromising the way that we do our work and, and, and exploiting them. And selling out is not something that we're doing. I think a lot of the time what they mean by sellout is that we're making too much money. And I think this leads in really well to one of, one of the rants you did a little while ago, which is about how tenuous our grasp is right now. As YouTubers, we are at the absolute mercy of Google right now. I mean, I, I ranted about this a little bit earlier in the show, the way that Google Plus is being integrated into YouTube and the way that Google attempts to take tighter and tighter and tighter hold on the reins as time goes on um, of, this, of this YouTube platform that they've built. And I mean, do you go a day without thinking, what if the whole thing exploded right now? Um, you know, what's my exit strategy? Well, I don't, uh, I think about it exploding tomorrow, but I do have about three exit strategies, so that helps. But if I didn't have exit strategies, I'd absolutely be worrying about it. And initially I was, when I first got my partnership, I thought, this is amazing. Wow, look at this gravy train. Isn't this fantastic? But what if it dies out tomorrow? Where do I go? Do I go back to the temp agency? Do I have a way of building my brand to the point where I have an escape route? And now, yes, I do. I've got several options but you're right. It is tenuous. And as a result, a lot of us will look to make as much money as we can from now because we have no idea when it's going to end. The hope, of course, is that it never does. And that 20 years from now, there will be a YouTube or some equivalent that allows us to continue to produce the media that you like to watch and that we love to make. But right now, it could end. And it's in my best interest to try and make as much money as I can without compromising my principles and my audience and to put it in a bank account and put it into my 401k to make sure that I actually have money if this whole thing goes tits up. So let's, let's get into some real meaty discussion topics here. I wanted to pick stuff that has some pretty good, I mean, not that I'm saying what we've been talking about up till now hasn't been meaty, but what these guys want, which is hardware, gaming news, and we've got some stuff that overlaps pretty darn well. So let's start with the Steam Controller demo. I'm assuming yeah. you've checked this out, correct? Absolutely. This... I had a look at it. Oh. 
It looks like an owl. This it's, looks it's very strange. <laughs> balls to the walls, amazing. And I'm actually uh, I'm tethered to my Fallen phone Housing. right I'm now, so unfortunately I'm not going to be able to play the video here, guys. But project. here it is. It's the um, Steam to put controller a demonstration. That shows you do a YouTube search for that. You're going to be able to bring that up. Different types of and games, so uh, why don't we just give like you know what? Here, I'll let you. I'll let you take this away. Give us a brief outline of I want to hear your thoughts when you initially saw the Steam controller because I think that's going to be a little different from how you feel about it now and how you feel having seen the video that you've seen. All right, well, funnily enough, I felt better about the Steam Controller before I saw the video as opposed to anything else. The Steam Controller's idea is very nice, and I like the fact that, for once, we are getting a paradigm shift in controllers. The last big one that we had for core gamers, we're not going to count motion controls because generally core gamers don't use them, it was the DualShock 1, which right. was about 15 years ago. PS1. And that innovated the dual stick design which was then used in several generations of controller hardware. And now we're looking at the idea of dual touchpads with haptic feedback, which could potentially shift things over again. Can they be better in some way than sticks? Because if they can't, there's basically no point in them existing. And when I looked at it, I thought, there's the possibility. But the, the haptic feedback itself has got to be incredibly good because we're talking about a device that doesn't have the physical limits of sticks. If I take my controller right now and I push on the stick hard, I reach the limit of where it can go very quickly. With the haptic device, with the touchpads, not so much. And we're relying on that feedback to say, guys, here's the limit, don't go any further. And then when I saw the video... What you notice in the Civilization V demonstration is exactly the same problem that is in place with touchpads on laptops and even my television yes. it has a touchpad controller. And it's horrible. You have to keep sort of just flicking your thumb on it over and over and over again. And that's the exact thing that I hoped wouldn't happen because I find that very, very uncomfortable. So there's a couple different ways it can work. I think the one that I was most impressed by was the portal demo. It looked really good, but what I realized while I was watching it, so he was using that one as a touchpad as well. It works a number of different ways, so it can work more like a stick if you want, but this yep. one was just straight, so for those of you watching who haven't seen the video, it's just straight, it's, it's, it's a touchpad. And um, it looked kind of good. He was controlling the game, but I didn't see any precision platforming going on. I, was, I didn't see any actual portal puzzles solved. I wasn't convinced that this was a gaming experience that could actually work from the couch. And, and the, the other thing that bothered me about the Civ 5 demos, I mean, the first thing he said when he saw this controller was, holy crap, I can play Civilization from my couch. I would make the argument you still can't because it's still going to have small UI elements and it's going to be a very long time before that kind of an issue gets addressed. And touchpad yep. will always, always, always be slower than the mouse for any kind of precision and any kind of distance movement, which is an awful lot of what you do when you're playing a PC game. I believe you can change the scale of the UI in Civ for one, I think so. And then for two, you can change the different modes the touchpads are in. He said in the video that he was using it in yes. one to one. You can make it act yep. more like a joystick where if you hold it on one side, it will keep going. So if it's on a big game like that, you can still have the more precision of it, but then have it act in a different mode. And the haptic feedback is going to have to be amazing if that mode is going to be worth its salt. Of course, but then that's the whole thing behind it is the haptic heat feedback is supposed to be the best that we've ever seen. So hopefully it is. We haven't. That's one thing about these videos, and they're talking about releasing more in the future. He asks at the end of the video to make sure that people comment on it and tell them what games they want to see and what other stuff they want yeah. to see. But something we won't be able to see through a video is the haptic feedback. So it has to be really good, and we won't know until anyone gets their hands on it i mean csgo yeah. the csgo demo was amazing where he did the the time trial what did you think of the csgo demo then that wasn't too bad honestly but i have a feeling he could have done a fairly similar thing with sticks I mean, if you notice the time it took for him to actually headshot something yes a yeah. good a good player someone that maybe plays a lot of call of duty or battlefield on a controller could probably do a similar thing yeah How so about that doesn't curve? Here's that could consider. be the real tricky thing. I mean, is it even intuitive in the way that it actually works? We know how touchpads work, but we don't want it to work like touchpads because they're bad. So <laughs> why would we want that on our pad? So what kind of adaptation will be required from... And more to the point, there'll be two kinds of adaptation required. We've got the guys who have to adapt from using a traditional dual stick controller and the guys that have to adapt from keyboard and mouse, yeah. which I would imagine is going to be a completely different process. Yeah, oh, That's yeah. going to be tricky. I, I, I mean, I think the only way you can tell is just to actually try it out. I read the 
nice blog post by the fellow who made Super Meat Boy. That's what I would have loved yeah. to have seen in that video. You had him in the studio, film him playing. He demonstrated apparently that you could play Meat Boy on this thing accurately. And that in itself is more of a test than anything that they showed there. But I think they just wanted to show variety in that initial video. Yeah, the one that I thought was kind of funny, but but I get it, was the, uh, what, what was that last game called? Uh, Papers, Please. Yeah. So this yes. was like a, yeah. what, what, like, like a passport office uh, simulator. It is, yes. It's like very, it. very cool. Um, and I was like, okay, that's, that's fascinating. But to me, I was looking at it going, oh, well, hold on a second. From a couch gaming perspective, um, maybe now I'm interested because I don't necessarily want to play FPS games with it. I have... Um, a nerdy tech couch master, which is like mm -hmm. cushions that sit on either side of you and like this deck that sits on top so you can actually use a keyboard and mouse from your couch very right. comfortably. <laughs> um, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, so I have, I have no desire for controller. Yes, it's right, it's right there. So he just lifted it up. Um, <laughs> so I don't need that. But if I wanted to play Angry Birds from the couch and the haptic feedback, you know, gave me, you know, how, how you know, what the tension was like as I was pulling back. I mean, I would that be excited to see Android support for a device like this, but it's something Valve hasn't talked about at all up till this point in time. No, that's very true. They have very much pressed the idea that this thing will be legacy compatible in the sense yeah. that it can emulate a bunch of different control methods. But what I'm more interested in are control methods very specifically designed for use on this thing, which yeah. is most likely going to require either Valve to get its hands dirty and work on a scheme itself, which they've obviously already done for Portal, or for third-party devs to get on board with it and say, yeah, actually, we will add direct support for it and we will experiment with it to make sure that we get the right kind of results. And I imagine that the success rate is going to vary quite dramatically, depending on... Oh, you still there? Uh, one thing to talk about, too, is he, he talked about developers having to get behind it and uh, Steve and Valve having to get behind it. But one really nice thing, too is going to be, uh, it's workshop capable. So people are going to be able to make their own layouts um, on their own and release it on the workshop. And you're going to be able to download it. So for really popular games, like I know the workshop for Skyrim is super popular. So if you want to make a crazy Skyrim mod that you should have some sort of other interface for and you were using this controller, you could also release a Steam controller workshop mod for it as well. But that's a lot more work, isn't it? So it comes down to whether or not this thing is actually worthwhile and people exactly. really get onto it. Because honestly, the 360 pad is already what I consider the controller standard for PCs if you're yep. not using a keyboard and Absolutely. mouse. Absolutely. Because that, that support is already there. The thing that drives me crazy about the 360 controller is in spite of all the game devs that work on the Xbox platform and in spite of Microsoft's, I mean... Um, influence in the industry, 360 controller support is still terrible for crying out loud. <laughs> Yeah, it, it honestly is. And when it is implemented, it often just overrides everything else. It's like, yeah. oh, great, I'm going through a tutorial and I'm being asked to press the left trigger on my keyboard. Great, <laughs> that's, that's really useful. Exactly, exactly. It's incredibly frustrating. Um, so if there's nothing else to add on this topic, I think we, we have a pretty similar sort of take on this. I'm, I'm taking a very wait-and-see approach. I'm really looking forward to seeing Yeah, it's a wait-and-see. Yes, wait-and-see. Um, let's move on to the next one, which I think is a, a great discussion topic. I appear to, have you ever heard of Locker Gnome or Chris Perillo? I have not. Okay. I appeared on his channel. He's more of a hardware guy. Um, I guess about a week and a half ago. And what I said when I was on there, he, he did a quick little sort of interview with me because we were hanging out at the airport together. I said, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One are the last generation of consoles as we know them. This is the last dedicated, large size gaming box that is expected to go into your living room. And the comments on that video are absolutely tearing me apart because I think a lot <laughs> of it is due to the, the very negative publicity that surrounded Xbox One and Microsoft's attempt to differentiate it from a pure gaming console and make it more of a living room companion. And I think part of it is that people are not looking at the bigger picture here in terms of how the hardware is changing and how these platforms are changing and thinking about how long 
PS4 and Xbox One are going to be on the market because we have seen that console lifespans are elongating as time goes on mm -hmm. to the point where we could be stuck with these things for 10 years. Now, there was a we recent comment made by, uh, one of, by one of the Tekken guys saying that the PlayStation 5 likely won't be a console, or probably won't be a console, I believe was the word used. What's your take on this? Will we see another generation of dedicated gaming consoles the same way we have up till now? Well, I think it would surprise me if the PS5 was basically just a bunch of servers in the cloud, right? I think maybe they might be jumping the gun slightly on that one. I think it's coming, and I don't think there's a way to avoid it unless somehow, in some inexplicable fashion, the PC vastly regains its dominance, which I find highly unlikely, yeah. considering you could basically email on your fridge now. This is not <laughs> a unique feature. And funnily enough, the same thing is happening in the television space, and nobody's talking about that. The newer generation televisions are getting smarter. I have owned two generations now of smart TVs that have almost all the functionality that the Xbox One is offering to a television watcher, and also a someone that consumes on-demand media. It's very good at dealing with that. I've got voice control. I could say, hi, TV, Netflix, and it will take me there. And I can navigate with my hand in the air. I don't even need to use a remote in order to get the result out of that. And that's going to keep happening, and it's going to happen at a faster rate because televisions are coming out all the time. Consoles aren't. Consoles are coming out every eight to nine years. Yeah, yeah. There's going to be new TVs every couple of months. More to the point, this functionality can be upgraded. I just upgraded my TV with a quad-core processor. Yeah, that's There's the an upgrade Samsung kit upgrade for the Samsung. Right? Yeah, it's the Samsung. Yeah. I just plugged it in, installed it, and I got all the functionality of a 2013 version. It's modular. Consoles are not. And as a yeah. direct result, these features are going way faster than console manufacturers could ever possibly and hope to get. And we have to, to look at the companies involved. I mean, how much does Sony have to gain by building PlayStation functionality into their TVs? They've already done it with their tablets. They've already done it with They've their other They've done it with their Blu-ray players. I mean, TV... Blu-ray player uses the, uh, the, what is it called? The... Uh, the, the kind of same interface as the PlayStation 3. Yeah. yeah. So, so they, you know, they're even building it into their other devices that are not gaming related. I mean, PS4 isn't out yet and they're doing it. Anyone mm -hmm. telling me that PlayStation 5 is going to be a dedicated box that sits next to your TV, you need to give yourself a shake and wake up because it, it's not necessarily going to be a cloud service. I agree with you 100%. I don't yeah. think that the latencies will be good enough, even 10 Take years there, from yeah. now, for much yeah. of the world for that to be a possibility. Um, even if it keeps progressing at the same exponential rate of improvement that it is now, which it isn't in a lot of places, but is in some places, and that's exactly the problem, I don't think that's going to happen. I think we're going to see tighter integration. One of my predictions was I thought we were going to see the closed platform game consoles go away. I thought we might see devices like Ouya or NVIDIA Shield, um, things running on Android or iOS or whatever other variants, whether it's uh, Ubuntu Mobile, whatever it happens to be, I think that is the direction versus server somewhere and also versus a dedicated box that sits there, which is to me just absolutely ridiculous and the other thing is the other tv players are going to want a piece of this action and tv tvs have become such a commodity horrible horrible business as someone who worked at a retailer that was trying to break into tv i can tell you there's not a lot of margin there's not a lot of marketing funds being thrown around and the reason is because they're not making money on it anymore every household already has a tv that's big enough and this ties in really well to one of the things we talked about earlier in the show which is that display size display sizes are big enough we don't need bigger displays yeah you can't get any bigger them. sorry yeah I was going to say, you can't get any bigger. You can't fit them in the oh. house. It's not like the houses are expanding at exponential rates. They're getting smaller. You know, I can't have a 90-inch television in this room. It's impractical. Yeah. And one thing, actually, that Total Biscuit brought up earlier was the modularity of the TV. Maybe uh, there's going to be, like, the Samsung modularity part, and then maybe they'll have, like, the game port. Yep. And you can just, like, click in new upgrades all the time. Game port. Yeah, you know? exactly. Maybe you can customize that television to be yep. a little bit better at gaming. Maybe you can have a dedicated graphics device. My TV has Angry Birds on it which is yeah. it actually runs surprisingly well. And <laughs> there are ga game functionality is starting to be built into this stuff and interplay between what's in your living room with what you carry around in your pocket, that being your smartphone or your tablet, is happening more and more. It's very easy to now interface. Uh, yeah. Just I have a, a Google internet TV upstairs. I press one button on my smartphone. That YouTube video is now on the TV. Yeah. And it's incredible. Yeah, just like snap like that. Very, very yeah. easy. And honestly, you've got to think about third-party game devs as well. They have a lot to gain from the current console war market going away. 
Uh, yes. People have spoken out. Sony, like a VP at Sony, spoke out against exclusives for consoles. The guy who is responsible for PlayStation 3's recent dominance with a, a great AAA exclusive after Drake great triple a exclusive is saying don't it it's hurts bad devs. for devs it hurts gamers yeah yeah, yeah. it hurts everyone there's no benefit it, it's it, the thing is it's like it's basically like mutually assured destruction yeah, yeah. mad global thermonuclear war we've got <laughs> nukes because they got nukes we've got exclusives because they got exclusives yeah. that's the they don't want to be sinking this amount of money into this stuff they would prefer if they didn't have to they would prefer just to be able to make games that can sell to more people. The other guys, you know, Sony makes a AAA from one of their in-house studios that they're then able to sell to twice as many gamers because it now works on Xbox. And differentiate with the device. Differentiate with the controller. Differentiate with the quality of the service that you're providing, with your live platform. I mean, there's so many other ways that game consoles can differentiate from each other now compared to how it was 20 years ago when it was, you know, who had, uh, who had Mario and who had sonic the hedgehog i mean why are we still in this mentality that just doesn't make any sense anymore it doesn't it really doesn't because you know what snuck up behind these guys and what they didn't see coming and sideswiped them completely was the rise of mobile and social gaming yeah. and we have had a drop in the amount of games sold you know, we're looking at 17 percent shrinkage in the console marketplace last year probably going to be helped a lot this year by gta gotta say but there are very few titles that can actually the market that much, and they're yeah. not going to be coming out every year. So they are thinking, oh, God, where are we in five years? And how exactly do we make our money? Because we're not making our money selling consoles. We're making a loss selling consoles. We need to sell games. And we are getting a cut every time a game is sold. So yeah. we need more games to be sold. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that I mean, I think one of the things that people misunderstood a lot about the whole I think consoles are going away prediction and the, the way this business is changing prediction is I said, I think mobile devices are going to pick up a lot of that slack. I didn't mean that you're going to play all your games on your phone. That's not what I meant. You're still going to want a big screen experience. I'm not, an, I'm not an I'm not an idiot. It's just that the device that powers it is going to be very different. We've already, I mean, have you played with the NVIDIA Shield at all? Yeah, I played with it, and it's like, oh, this has got nice functionality. It's got good onboard power, but I can also relay something for a more powerful base station in my house, and I can play PC quality games on this little thing. And that's unbelievable to me. I mean, that to me is is insane. Did you notice, um, did you notice latency that interfered with your gameplay experience? Only a little bit, and it was on a beta unit on the Wi-Fi of PAX. Yeah, PAX's <laughs> Wi-Fi, as in the most rammed Wi-Fi in the history of ever. <laughs> and we got maybe two moments where it froze up a little bit. Aside from that, it was very difficult to notice. So, I mean, imagining that, you know, Tegra 4 or 5, I mean, that is Tegra 4, imagining Tegra 5 or 6 or 7 isn't going to be able to run and gun with Xbox One and PS4, I think is just uh, very short-sighted. I'd like to take just a brief moment here to uh, ask the viewers, guys, if you have any Twitter questions about any of the topics that we've talked to Total Biscuit about during the show here, guys, hit us. We'll get them to do a Twitter blitz before we let them go. And in the meantime, I have one more topic for you. Um... <laughs> how it, what tell me about any of your weird internet famous moments because you must get it a fair bit i think total internet views you're somewhere between double and triple what i've done in my lifetime and i get recognized on the street a fair bit uh, how does it how do you feel about it tell me tell me any awkward stories you have well, I, I made the decision to go to North Carolina so no one would notice me. So that worked pretty well and until I ended up in the university towns. I turned up in Raleigh and Durham for recent events like, oh, yeah, people know me around here. So that's the way that that goes. I, I think I've been very fortunate in the fact that most of the stuff that I've had interaction wise has not really been weird at all. It's like there's a lot of sort of double taking that goes on if somebody recognizes your voice or anything along those lines. I was in an outback at one point and someone walked past me and then asked me if I was who I was and then asked for an autograph on a napkin. And that, that was kind of cute, but it's never really been weird or awkward, strangely enough. The worst thing I can ever say is, oh, some of these guys are a little bit socially awkward. Maybe they don't go out all that much. But if that's the worst sin that you are guilty of in your life, then you know you're a saint in my opinion so it it's all really been actually very very cool indeed but 
the whole thing is just weird. The whole idea that someone could recognize you in a supermarket from some gaming video you made on the internet is insanity. And if you tell told me 10 years ago that was possible, I'd have laughed at you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you know what? I think for me the awkwardness really doesn't come from the viewers. For me the awkwardness especially at the beginning came from me. Um, so one story I'll tell, actually two stories. Uh, I don't generally get recognized by my voice because I'm not, uh, I'm not a game streamer. I think I'm more, more visual. Um, but I had one guy, I was talking to a coworker at the McDonald's down the street from work. We were there for lunch because I felt like punishing my stomach. Um, hey, McDonald's, if you're watching, I, we could use some sponsorship right about now. Speaking of me talking honestly about potential sponsors. Um, so anyway, the guy, I'm talking to my friend, the guy turns around and he goes, I know that voice. And I was, I was like, oh, holy crap, that's the weirdest thing ever because it was one of the very early ones. But the very first one, I think, was the most awkward one. And he wasn't the one who made it awkward. It was me. I was at a mall with, yeah. my, with my girlfriend at the time. And um, someone walked up and asked for my autograph. And I, I kind of I froze up and I was like, oh, I don't really do that. Um, sorry, I'm just, I'm just here shopping. And she, we got to the escalator and she turned to me and she just smacked me in the arm. And I was like, she was like, why did you say that? That was horrible. You made him feel really awkward and bad. And I was like, well, I'm sorry. I didn't, no, I didn't, I didn't mean to. I just didn't know what to say. I've, I'm, I'm not used to this thing. I'm not, I'm not Tom Cruise where people walk up and tell me that they saw me jumping around on a couch all the time. It's, I'm just not used to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got used to it pretty quickly, I think, just by going to a lot of events and really just interacting there. Even some people in the esports scene or just in gaming in general that have developed these followings don't necessarily know how to act with fans or maybe they just don't want to. They they feel uncomfortable doing it because they themselves were socially awkward. I became outgoing and irritating when I was 18 years old. <laughs> and I find being outgoing and irritating is a very useful skill to have in university, which is why I developed it rapidly through a course of very strong drinking and vomiting. And then I was able to carry that on into later life. And when I go to an event, I'll just I'll just hang out with anybody. Like, probably to the detriment of my health. Someone's going to knife me this one of these days. But I'll hang out with pretty much anyone. And we'll go for drinks. And we'll go for lunch together. And we'll talk. And we'll play Munchkin and yell at each other. And it'll be great. And I think it's something that maybe you just have to embrace in that kind of scenario. And you'll have a lot more fun if you do. And, you know, obviously, I know you guys are at PAX. And no doubt you experience this exact same thing. It's so much fun when you just get to meet people. And you automatically share interests because you do this for a living and they watch you. So it's like, oh, great. We already gel on some base level. We don't even have to worry about it's like, so do, do you like uh, television? Do you, do you like the sports? <laughs> no, we had a lot like, of No, no, we're in the games and tech. We like that shit. Let's we go. had a game we were running at PAX, uh, courtesy of Western Digital, one of our sponsors. Speaking of the way sponsors benefit not just us, but also our viewers, where uh, WD nice <laughs> gave us a whack ton of free hard drives and free swag to give away to anyone who recognized us at the show. And we announced we were going to be doing it ahead of time. So people who walked up to us, you know, hey, I just want to shake your hand. Hey, shake my hand. Have an external hard drive while you're at it. I mean... That kind of stuff, I think, I gets me really excited and ha makes makes this this occupation extremely fun for me. My uh, my yeah, favorite fan interaction at PAX was one group of guys I randomly met, and there's like four or five of them. We ended up playing Cards Against Humanity, which was like not something you'd really expect to do with fans, but was incredibly fun. And then another one, I had my whole group of friends, and we ended up playing a giant game of Ninja with a few fans, like the the stand up game Ninja. So that was actually really fun yeah. as well. So yeah, it's um, the best thing. So Twitter Blitz is a little thing we do where you answer people's Twitter questions as quickly as possible and we blow through as many of them right. as we can. I think we've got probably about 20 here for you. Go through as many until you, as, until you get bored as you want. So number Easy one. Easy peasy. We need more than 20. This isn't a challenge. Come on. John, I'm thinking of starting a hardware YouTube channel in my own language. I have the knowledge. Any advice for starting a YouTube channel? I guess I'll jump in first. My advice is at this point in time, unless you have some serious backing, um, don't. Get a real job and do it as a hobby, but don't expect this to be a career right off the bat. Go ahead. Yep, never ever go into this thinking of being of doing this as work. Do it as a hobby because you feel a passion for it, and that passion will be communicated to your viewers, and hopefully that will allow you to have success. And the best advice I could ever give to starting a YouTube channel is start by starting a YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, 
Good. All right, next one. Do you think a stronger YouTube presence, um, such as you know guys like guys like you who focus on PC, has made PC more popular amongst gamers, or do you think you're just catering to an audience that was already interested in PC gaming in the first place? Well, I'd like to think that it did. I know that there's console gamers that came to my channel and watched it and eventually ended up getting back into gaming PCs. Yep. But I think maybe that swing was going to happen anyway. I don't know if we necessarily just rode the wave or if we were one of the kind of the people that caused that wave to occur in the first place. Really difficult to say. You know, I'd like to assume that we did something. Corey Gibson, are you excited for... I'm not calling you Corey Gibson. The question is from Corey Gibson. Um, are How you offensive. excited for AMD Mantle? Are you familiar with Mantle from AMD? Yeah, low-level API stuff. Yes. Uh, hopefully will involve getting DirectX out the bloody window, which would be <laughs> wonderful. I don't want to go up to Windows 8 to use DirectX 11.2 features. Thank you very bloody much, Microsoft. Anything that takes the control away from Microsoft is a good thing. Unfortunately, I use NVIDIA cards, so it's probably not going to help me that much. But I like the idea that stuff like OpenGL is kind of having a bit of a resurgence. So hopefully we get more of that. All right. Uh, someone asks, what's with the hats? Um, well, we, we thought the hats would be kind of <laughs> funny just because, you know, well, it's, it's a hat. and uh, it's, it's Total Biscuit. Yeah, hats are always biscuit. funny. He's our guest. I, I, did, did you think it was funny? Did you see this coming? I expected hats to be involved. The irony being that I'm the only one who's not wearing one because I kind of jacked the top hat in two years ago because I want to be taken seriously. <laughs> you, know, you guys don't have that problem. <laughs> All right. Um, Total Biscuit, do you believe PC gaming will ever go away? Wow, this is a tough one. Well, you'd have to get rid of PCs in order for PC gaming to go away. Basically, if you can put a game on something, then it will have a game on it. Put it on a TI-83 calculator, you've got games on those bloody things, so you're certainly going to have them on computers. The question, I suppose, is will PCs continue to exist in their current form? Probably not. Eventually, they will be replaced by all-in-one tablet-like devices. Maybe those devices will be modular, but if the essence of the PC is still there and the power is still there, what form it takes doesn't really matter. Agreed. Uh, Marcus asks, what's the worst WTF is game you have ever tried? And uh, he asked what the be what's the best, but I think worst is going to be a lot more entertaining, so why don't we stick with that? Wor worst is a lot easier. Recently, it's got to be day one Gary's incident, which was... Uh, just an abomination apparently it used most of the default stuff from the udk development kit so it had these gigantic bananas because they couldn't get the size right on the default <laughs> unreal bananas so it's like banana trees and all these models and th the game was just utterly incapable of doing anything right to the point of beyond comedy to the point where this is just a waste of everybody's time so that was just off. I'd say that's it's worse than the War Z. The War Z had at least some value to it, even though it was a gigantic scam. Day One Gary's incident is quite literally unplayable Drek. So <laughs> it's probably that, I would say. Uh, there's no doubt there been uh, games over the past couple of years that have been equally bad to that, but that's the one that sticks out in my memory of late. Fantastic. Okay, well, I, uh, I think that was it for the topics we wanted to go through with you. I uh, just want to say thank you very much for joining us. I mean, uh, when, it's my pleasure. When the Twitter followers, I mean, I, I, I try to engage with the audience in ways that are meaningful. And so I, I'd like to ask them, who do you guys want to see as a guest on the WAN show? And uh, when they said Total Biscuit, I kind of went, well, shit, okay, I'll try. <laughs> um, and I, you know what? I really appreciate you taking the time to interact with us, interact with our audience. If you, uh, if you think there's anyone left viewing who doesn't know what you're about and doesn't think that, yeah, you know, this guy's pretty cool. I'm going to follow him or this guy's a total ass clown. I don't want to listen to him anymore at all. Then please do give one more pitch for where people can find you. And uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. I really appreciated it. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thanks a lot, guys. It was a fun show. If you want to check me out for PC gaming critique, gaming news, and an obscenely unhealthy amount of Hearthstone coverage, then head over to youtube.com slash cynicalbrit. That's youtube.com slash cynicalbrit. I also have a StarCraft 2 esports channel and a StarCraft 2 esports team, Axiom Esports. You can find out everything you want to know about them over at youtube.com slash totalbiscuit. And thank you very much to Axiom Esports sponsors, that being a Planet Side 2 and Wazda Keyboards. All right. Thanks, man. Take care, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime. Thanks a lot, guys. Have fun. All Have right. a good one. All right, guys. So that was, uh, that was definitely one of the more fun guest segments for me, just because it's not very often that um, 
I have an opportunity. So yeah, we don't need these anymore. But I have an opportunity to bring on guests that are more experienced and um, more successful than me on the YouTubes. So I hope we didn't bore you guys too much with some of that business talk about you know audience interaction and engagement and YouTube and how how we feel about it as YouTubers. But uh, yeah, that was that was very entertaining, guys. Again, so make sure make sure you're following. Uh, make sure you're following him because uh, very, very entertaining. I actually have to confess, I'm not much of a gaming content consumer. I had never watched one of his videos before I found out we were going to have him on the show and I was like, holy crap, okay, I need to know what I'm talking about somewhat. So I spent hours <laughs> watching the different, the different content and that it's actually very entertaining but in a very different sort of way from a lot of the other content. It's more designed and you can tell like radio to the point where you can have it in the background while you're doing something else. He's got a great voice, which is some, a benefit that I don't have. Uh, he's got a great voice, so you can just sit and catch up, and it's very soothing and very relaxed, and uh, I on, really on enjoy the, the content. Hand, I consume an insane amount of gaming content. Um, and <laughs> I've been watching Cynical Brit for a long time, because one of the main things that I like about it, for anyone who hasn't watched, is his WTF series is amazing. So whenever Steam has, like, a summer sale or a winter sale or a weekly sale or a weekend sale. There's always sales going on everywhere, GOG or whatever. If you're interested in a game that you may not have heard of, if you check out his WTF is, like he said, like Linus said, you can have it in a different tab while you're doing other things and just listen to him talk about the game. And sometimes, especially during the summer sale, I don't have enough time to do independent research for every single game that comes up on that sale. So what I'll do is while I'm working on other things, I'll pop up a WTF is working on other things and then be like, oh, that game sounded really interesting and it's two freaking dollars. So sure, boom, buy that. We never published the WAN show starting thing on YouTube. I was wondering why viewers were... I selected it and yeah, because we, I mean, having a great guest like that, we should have probably had another thousand to 1500 live viewers. Oops. I, I, I mean, you saw surprised. me click it. I didn't. Actually. You didn't? Oh, no. okay. Well, there, here's the thing public like I, it's I wasn't, right there i wasn't looking it yeah wasn't that anyway early. not not impressed with not impressed with that right now but i guess there's not a whole lot that we can do about it um well let's move into our next topic here i mean there's a there's a ton of stuff to talk about today i don't think quite as much as the last two weeks but there is still quite a bit to talk we've about. we've got deeper topics though i mean this ties in pretty well to uh some of what we've been talking about already the mojo so they, they ripped off Ouya's concept of using all capital letters and having a four-letter word as the name of your console. Other than that, it's, it's a little bit different. So this is from Mad Cats, of all companies. Mad Cats has, of course, been more of a staple in the console realm than it has been on the PC side, although they are making... They're pushing. They're pushing pretty hard with, uh, with pro product lines like the Rat Series mice that they have. So and this, they've acquired companies. And they've acquired companies as well, companies like SciTech that did have more of a foothold in PC. But let's uh, let's talk about this a little bit. So Mojo is a micro console for Android. The original article was on Tech Radar, and it was posted by Gazer96 on the Linus Tech Tips forum. And I mean, I guess I don't have much to say about this that I haven't already said. And that's this is still more validation for my belief that not only do I think that consoles in their current form as closed platforms and, and with, with console exclusive games are gonna go away, but there are other people in, in companies that are investing big money into this belief as well. So spec wise, um, you wanna run through the specs? Um, sure, give me a sec. I think that's on the dock. Yes, yeah. it is. So it comes with a 1.8 gigahertz Tegra 4 processor, 16 gigabytes of internal storage, although it has micro SD expansion, so that could get pretty ridiculously big pretty fast. Um, two gigs of built-in RAM, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and Android 4.2.2 Jelly Bean. And it comes in at 250 bucks. So, like, ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. One, Look, one thing that a really common, yeah, I know I saw that. One thing that I noticed was really common where people were saying, oh my god, it blows Ouya out of the water in the specs department. Of course it does. It's been a little while. Um, <laughs> it's like, this is going to happen, especially Android consoles that I think are going to leapfrog each other like crazy. Like yearly at least. Yeah, and, and one thing that's especially good with this one is you can tie it in your, with your Google Play account directly. So if you did another yearly iteration because they're going to be updating really fast, um, you can just load all your games again, which is actually really nice. Which is really cool. I mean, and, and the Android experience compared to discs 
and compared to all that legacy crap that comes along with consoles, I think is going to be very compelling for couch gamers. And this was another interesting thing about it for me was that it's priced at $249.99. Okay, well that validates the pricing of NVIDIA Shield, in my mind, in a big way. Because Shield has a controller and a bunch of hardware and a screen. And it has that NVIDIA custom technology with the game streaming that you know, required some dev work. Is that worth 50 bucks? I would say yes. And uh, to the people out there saying, oh, well, NVIDIA Shield should be 99.99, on what planet? I think a lot of those people are coming from the same angle I was at the beginning, which was I didn't even care at all about, and I still don't, the Android part of NVIDIA Shield. It has the same hardware as a $700 smartphone. Wh uh, what I'm saying is it shouldn't, or there should be another model that doesn't have that. There should be a PC streaming model that is cheaper and doesn't have all the Android stuff, because I don't care about all the Android stuff, personally. Okay. I want to stream from my computer and that's all I want. So I, I can't justify, I think what a lot of those people are coming from is they don't want to justify the Android part, which is the more expensive part. If you want to have the Android part built in there, it's going to be more expensive because you need a Tegra chip and yada, yada, yada. Okay, fair enough. I guess I can't really, I can't really argue that any part of that was incorrect. Um, <laughs> you know what? I would like to take a moment to do one of our sponsor breaks. So guys, I didn't, uh, I had to reset up everything. So I'm just kind of hoping this will work. Hey, <laughs> look at that. That worked. Did so squarespace.com. I'm just going to go ahead and fix this for them. Squarespace.com is the easy way. Did, okay. Oh, he didn't fix it. He updated the the, 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 the offer code, but it's 10% off for October, guys. So, so <laughs> don't worry about any of that. Anyway, squarespace.com is the easy way to build a professional website for your blog, business, um, for just general information for your company, whatever else it happens to be. They've got a ton of templates, over 20 templates that are custom tailored for different applications. They handle the hosting on their side. They handle the tools that are extremely deep and go beyond just, you know, uh, GeoCities and you know drag and drop this or drag and drop that with advanced modes you can actually dig into the CSS and the HTML and you can get it looking exactly the way you want you can have live previews so you know if I tell you know Edsel hey I want this thing moved from the top to the bottom he can make that change boom it's active the site was never down yeah. so it's extremely simple to use and if you sign up for Squarespace you can go to squarespace.com slash Linus and get 10% off one zero ten percent. Uh, it's like trying to cover it, but yeah. that doesn't work. I know it doesn't yeah. work. I'm trying to cover <laughs> it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can get ten percent off with code Linus ten. And you know what's actually funny is I didn't even realize this. I'm wearing my Squarespace shirt today. Oh wow! I didn't even realize that they were because I just threw on whatever because we were going to film at NCIX today, and I always change into my NCIX shirt when I get there. So I was like, oh, this shirt's really comfy. I'm gonna put it on because they sent me a shirt when we started the when Talking. we started the partnership. Talking and about sponsor stuff. And yeah, so I was like, I was like, oh yeah, this shirt is like, it's like nice. I'm gonna put this on anyway. So I happen to be wearing it today. So guys, that's Squarespace.com. Thank you so much for sponsoring the WAN show. And uh, I think that's pretty much it. If you want to check out an example Squarespace website, go over to LinusMediaGroup.com. It gives you a great example of how they dynamically adjust your uh, <laughs> what you have access to in terms of bandwidth and resources depending on what you need no matter how hard we've hit that site in the past we've never managed to take it down and when you consider that we've taken down a lot of manufacturer sites just by saying hey this manufacturer is really cool go check it out i think that speaks uh speaks volumes about the way that their setup is done it's actually kind of fun bringing down websites i did that with my stream once it's kind of fun but you can't say smaller. stuff like that live on the air it's kind of fun. it's fun bringing down webs that's a distributed by denial of service Attack. No, it's not. Giving them a whole bunch of traffic, and when they snap back and then actually have real traffic for most of it because it's not a DDoS, then it usually works. Okay. And DDoS is usually used incorrectly anyways if I want to go on this rant, so it could just be DOS in almost every single situation. But anyways, let's move on. 50% of Steam users can't buy next-gen games. Well, they could buy them. Well, yeah. They could run them, I guess. They could they could buy it and then, like, look at it in their Steam library. So like, Call of Duty cool. Ghosts and Watch Dogs need 64 gigs of... Or 6 gigs of RAM. 64, 64 gigs, gigs of RAM! Gigs of RAM. <laughs> and, 60, and a 64-bit OS. You know what I have to say about this? About bloody time. Yep. 
I have no problem with it. And like, okay, a ton of people are like, oh my god, 50% can't buy it, they're not gonna make any money. I think a huge part of the reason why 50% of PC users don't have these specs, um, I'm not too worried about the 64 bit OS one, but the six gigs of RAM, so they've never needed to. You don't need it yet. No, so, so now that they do need it, they might go to the store and buy a super cheap kit of RAM and fill those two extra slots that they've had for six well, years. bad timing for that Hynix fad to light on fire. It's but not that expensive yet. I, okay, but it's not as cheap as it was. No, right? that's it was true. cheap a little while ago. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a chicken and egg thing. There hasn't been a compelling reason to upgrade your CPU or your memory yeah. for the last four years. And I think there's going to be a very large percentage, not 50%, but a very large percentage of Steam users that will, two things actually, one, have multiple computers on Steam, like my laptop's on Steam, my laptop doesn't have more than that, yeah. but my desktop, which I'm actually going to play games on, does. Yeah. I'm only logged into my laptop so I can talk to friends and whatnot. Um, four, three out of four computers that I have on Steam are not ready for it, right. but I don't play games And like that doesn't mean you never took the hardware survey on it, because you just could click, 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 yeah, yeah, I want to exactly. watch my damn games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get on with and it. it's happened. So, and then yeah. and then there's the other group of users that, like, tons of my friends, I was like, no, 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 don't buy anything more than four gigs, leave two slots open, are just going to go, click, ready, yay. Exactly. Like, there's nothing else they have to do. So, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a big deal. And I mean, I think that we're, we're finally heading into a time where with game devs, uh, developing for next-gen consoles and wanting to leverage the more powerful PC hardware that's built up, been built up over the last eight years. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're heading into a time when games are going to get more demanding, and we're heading into a time when the way people are going to want to experience games is getting more demanding. Yeah. Things like stereoscopic 3D, whether it's on a display, which people don't necessarily... Not everyone's in agreement that that's a terrific experience, or whether it's more like something like a headset-mounted... Yeah. 3D, you know, not naming any names, Oculus. Um, so whatever, whatever it happens to be, where it's going to get more demanding. And then even for flat panel gaming, that's going to get more demanding too. 4K gaming will be a thing very, oh, yeah. very soon. Oh, yeah. Even two and a half K, that is 2560 by 1440 gaming, has become much more of a thing. I mean, those cheapo Korean monitors on eBay. You, you, it's funny because you go back at um, AMD had a slide at their GPU 14 event that was the rise of um, of, of lar higher resolution monitors. And you go back at, at greater than 1080p resolutions and it's like, eh, cheapo monitors on eBay. Pfft. And all of a sudden it's growing. The costs just have to... Yeah, they the, have the, to get a, to a reasonable level. The price to end users has to reflect the actual cost of these yeah. things. Display manufacturers need to get over people paying... The $50,000 TVs. You know, $50,000 for a TV and $1,000 for, you know, the new monitor that uses the, uh, has the new resolution, unless they're professionals. So get over it, and we're going to see a resurgence in increases, not in monitor size, but in monitor resolution, which I personally feel very strongly Definitely. is very important. Another thing that caught me off guard with this one is uh, COD requiring 50 gigabytes of space. That's huge. I, I know quite a few people that actually, since the SSDs became yes. um, generally affordable for many people, not everyone, but generally affordable for many people, have been running just SSD systems. Oh yeah. That might that, change a little that's bit. That's going to be over, absolutely. I mean, you talk to the hard drive guys. I mean, those of you who have been following us, speaking of sponsors, we have a relationship with Western Digital. And when we talk to them, very frankly, behind closed doors, it's like, how do you feel about SSD? Is the hard drive dead? They kind of go, well, what do you mean is the hard drive dead? Do you have any idea how much data people are storing? And I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, as much as, you know, Crucial might release a one terabyte class SSD or Samsung might release a one terabyte class SSD, these are still $500, $600 products. The crazy. general consumer is going to spend $500, $600 on a gaming machine, not on a drive that actually does nothing other than store your data. Hard drives are not dead, and we are going to continue to see larger and larger games because one of the things that I really noticed about gaming in 4K at the AMD event was, holy crap, these textures look terrible. Yeah. With this kind of pixel density they all look like ass it's kind of like when you moved up to 1600 by 1200 on your crt and realized that quake doesn't look very good <laughs> you know when the block and the texture is this big everything has to keep up in order for image quality to keep improving and so to me um 4k gaming is going to drive a big change in the way that everything is approached here so I don't even remember where I was going with all of that. Right, right. And so at 50 gig games are going to be the norm, not the exception moving forward. Which is going to be interesting for people downloading off Steam. Yes. Which actually might bring back 
discs a little bit. Well, hey, they're talking 300 gig uh, optical media. That so could as, hold us off for a little while longer yet. Seriously, because right now when you can download a game, which will like pretty much never be bigger than 9 gigs, it's yeah. not too bad to download overnight. And I we, know quite a few people that if they had to download a 50 gigabyte game, they could wait weeks. And when you can mail uh, a disc around the world for 4 bucks or whatever... <laughs> It's like, oh, okay. that maybe becomes reasonable. We're moving, we're moving backwards in terms <laughs> yeah. of the, the way the technology works. You know, the, this is funny because we filmed something at an Intel campus once, back with NCIX yeah. Tech Tips, and um, because uh, their legal team had to review the footage before I could take the footage away with me, they were like, oh, well, you can't take the footage with you, so uh, we'll mail it to you. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. You're Intel. And they're just like, yeah, we'll mail it to you. I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> really? So I, I, we, we went our separate ways. Their legal team reviewed the footage. They were like, yeah, we need you to... There, oh, there's a customer name here that's on this RMA drive. Blur and that, that big and, whiteboard. And, yeah, stuff yeah, like that. that. And they were like, yeah, careful with this stuff. Um, okay, what's your mailing address? I was like, come on. Let's FTP this. Let's do something. They couldn't... Because the way their security works at their campus, they were not allowed to leave with the data. <laughs> they, they had to... They, they weren't allowed to, they couldn't connect to an FTP, they couldn't do this, they couldn't do that. I was like, this is one of the most technologically advanced companies in the world. That can't use technologically advanced systems. <laughs> to like, and like, it, 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 to me, it was one of those things where I'm sitting here going, and still, we mail data around. Well, they, they probably have their, like, across their own yes. campuses, they probably has, have SFTP or their own I'm pipes. sure they do. Actually, honestly, it's Intel, they probably have their own pipes. But like... But it's funny, yeah. because in this day and age on the internet, it is still difficult to just send a file to someone. Yep. How many times do you struggle with attachment size limit? Or with like people who don't know how to use FTP and you're just like, oh, for, for crying out, okay, uh, I don't know, you send it and they want a paid account now. And, <laughs> holy crap. Wait, um, is it you send it or is it? High tail. <laughs> Whatever. Um, speaking of which, <laughs> when we originally introduced our rebranding for the live stream, The WAN Show, people complained about it. I haven't heard a complaint in a long time, so I think people got over it. Cool. Uh, speaking of things that people have gotten over, I've certainly gotten over this, roaming charges. Roaming data charges, roaming text charges, uh, roaming phone charges. Um, the Verge, this was posted on the Linus Tech Tips forum by Mr. Ivnak. I think that's what he was going for here. T-Mobile announces unlimited global data roaming at no extra charge. Go. It's 128 kilobytes a second, but still, that's yeah. enough to do a lot of what you really need to do when you're on the road. And one of his main comments actually is, we found, quote unquote, uh, quote, not quote unquote, uh, we found that a lot of our users were just turning off they were going to airplane mode, basically, when they were traveling. That's what I do. Because it will murder them. This, that part isn't a quote. But, like, <laughs> I can't remember exactly how he says it. But, basically, it would screw them over so they're scared, so they turn it all off. And he doesn't want that to be a thing. They want them to be able to still use it, even if it's not that great of an experience. And then, if you want to be able to, like, stream video constantly, because you're crazy while you're traveling, you can pay to get the fastest they can possibly get you and you can do it for a time, and it's not super expensive. So, I mean, everyone suffers from this, but here's the, here's the message I got from Bell when I traveled to Hawaii. $25 for 50 minutes, 50 megs, and 200 texts is a travel bundle, which is highway robbery, and if you don't get a travel bundle, then basically you better turn that airplane mode on because the rates are $1.45 per minute, including long distance, thanks for that, um, 75 cents per text, and six dollars per meg for data. Six dollars per meg. I mean, basically, what they're so doing what? is they are strong arming you into buying a mobile, a, a bundle, and then even then, the bundle is so small that you're still afraid to use it. You don't end up using it, and they just made a whack ton of money on. So, and, here's... Then, and then in his situation, you have constant speeds that you can you can do uh, all your at, social media. At you least can I can email. Instagram. You can Instagram. I can wait. You can probably stream minor amounts of music. I mean, being at events like GPU 14 for AMD, it was like, you know what? It would have been kind of cool if I could, you know, tweet Instagram things as I was Instagram traveling around or, or tweet or, or check my email for crying out yeah. loud. And I mean, this is the Yahoo article about this. So this was on Yahoo Finance. Suggests that maybe it's uh, unnecessary because, um, you know, Wi-Fi calling and texting services like iMessage, you know, when you're in your hotel or Starbucks is a good substitute already. Yeah, you know what? Whoever wrote not. that, you're an idiot. Yeah. Because <laughs> if I wanted, if, if that were true, everyone would have iPod touches. No one would need an iPhone. 
<laughs> really? Wi-Fi isn't actually that great of a solution. No, it's terrible. Because and there's a lot of places that it, a, it's not open, and you're not 100% of the time in Starbucks. And why are we accepting this? I'm paying for service. Like, why is it that Canada to U.S., which is basically the borderless border, I mean, it's the... Actually, they're really aggressive about keeping their border. You should do a little bit more research on that. Okay, no, no. Oh, do you mean the carriers? No, the, the, the line. Did you oh, know there's well, never anything in between that line and that line is always taken care of? Yes. They have multiple employees that work the line just to make sure that it's clean cut so that each side can tell that they're crossing. Yes, and I know that, they're but very it is, careful it is an border. unguarded border. It is the largest unguarded border in the world. It has more stretches of unguarded... Well, yeah, area. because there's more stretches of where no one lives. Yeah, okay, but that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not the point. The point is that compared to the borders in a lot of countries, that's it's true. not a big deal. Compared to compared to the diff, I mean, I can just use a driver's, or at least for a long time, I could just use a driver's license to drive down into the U.S. I don't need not a visa. I don't need, I didn't need a passport. It's, I, I mean, to me, the idea that, you know, the second you cross the border, and like the, the, the telcos are really good at this. They do it sometimes before you actually get over. And in like certain parts of Victoria, they're like, nope, you're in the States. You're below the line. You're in the States. It's like, what? It's like, boom, <laughs> you're roaming now. To me, is ridiculous. I mean, come on, guys. Um, cooperate a little bit. And you know what the funny thing is? Is the way I would have imagined the carriers would have wanted it to work was that they could bill each other because then they could all tell their users, well, we're the good guys. But those They're other those other yeah. jackasses are charging us when you're when you're roaming on their network over there. So there's nothing we can do. If they were smart, they would have gotten together in a back room with cigars and dogs playing poker on the wall. There you and do. Just... They would have, but they would have come up with that <laughs> idea because then yeah. they could have done it forever. They could have all done it forever. The way it's set up now, your carrier is the one actually charging you. So <laughs> T-Bone Mobile revealed that 90% of the roaming charges are pure profit. So, so they are charging them, but like nothing. Yes. So they've got they've gotten together in the back room and they made the wrong deal yeah. to not charge each other very much for roaming. They should have made the deal where they all just bend each other over for roaming and we, we get the short end of the stick. Because then T-Mobile wouldn't even be able to do this because then all of a sudden all the other carriers could just say, yeah, well, whatever, you can, you can charge our users very little to use your network and we'll just charge your users a lot to use ours. So. I bet you they actually tried and I bet you places like carriers in Canada were saying no because there's going to be less traffic in that direction. Um, so anyway, this, I mean, T-Mobile is still a, made, a minor player, but this could take a big chunk out of the uh, out of the market share of someone like an AT and T, where it's a yep. GSM, it's a GSM network, so people will tend to gravitate towards it, so that they can actually take their phone somewhere and use it, especially when it's carrier locked. Um, and then these guys could be a great alternative. It's, uh, phone calling it ha is not is not included. It's not unlimited, so it's twenty cents a minute. But at least that's reasonable. Yeah. At least if you talk to someone for three minutes, it's not five dollars. It's sixty cents. Would you? I mean, I feel like when people call me when I'm roaming, I'm like, "Yo, I'm roaming. You got thirty seconds. Go." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I wouldn't have to feel like that. So. And, Go T-Mobile. Wish I, you were in Canada. I think, yeah, seriously. I think I remember reading something in there too that you can get like long distance phone plans. I think it's ten bucks extra a month or yep. something. And they so so. And then that takes care of that. I mean, my carrier doesn't even offer any kind of a compelling like. And if they know, did, it would be like thirty dollars more. Or it wouldn't be. Oh, it'd be bucks. a lot more than that. Yeah. Like if I wanted a roaming plan that just includes me being allowed to be down in the states from time to time, no. <laughs> All right. So speaking of anti-competitive practices. Uh, this was sort of an alleged thing for oh, the damn. most part, but it seems to have been fairly on the money. There's 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 some evidence. It's it, yeah yeah. It's more than just like a smoking gun with no fingerprints on it, and no one was standing around when the gun went off, and like like there, there yeah. There's a few guns and so, they all fingerprints. Allegedly, I'm just gonna say allegedly, even if it's been proven already. I don't want to get in trouble here. But allegedly, Origin PC, so it's a boutique system builder in the states was paid handsomely to remove AMD GPU options. And not only that, but make very public statements. So this was posted by Tech Fanatic on the forum. Make very public statements about how, because of NVIDIA GPUs, better reliability and better stability, they were ditching AMD graphics cards entirely. Um, so they, they were really public about it. It basically looked like a, 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 a smear campaign, an anti-publicity campaign. Um, th so that's that's what it looked an awful lot like. The the uh, the original article that uh, is on semi accurate is actually probably one of the one of the better ones. 
Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, can't find it. Anyway, the original art, the article on semi-accurate, that's the most recent one, outlines a lot of the details of why something like this probably happened and why it makes a lot of sense because the timing doesn't look very coincidental. Um, the, the, yeah, not at all. I've heard rumors, and I'm not going to name any sources, and I don't want to be cited saying this for, for the most part, but I've heard rumors that the payoff was as much as six figures, and that it had to do with, it was proportional to the lost business that was projected that the companies would, un, would, would, be, would, would have to suffer by not selling AMD graphics cards. Well, okay, to oh, completely got, ignoring the current topic. It was also rumored they'd get early access to a, uh, NVIDIA's upcoming Maxwell GPUs. Yes, yeah. Completely ignoring the current topic, you, if this was a complete... Okay, say it's like a bakery, and they're making sure that they only use a certain type of flour. I don't know. But you would have to pay them off at least the amount that they would be losing by doing this, yeah. and a whole bunch more to make it public, and more to make it worth doing it, and then you'd have to give them further... Like, it, they're... If this happened, there are tons of incentives. Yeah, there there has to be incentives. I mean, and guys, don't imagine for a second that NVIDIA sat down and said, hey, if we give you a whack ton of money, will you denounce AMD in public? That's not really the way it works. It would be more like, um, you know, hey, we want to offer you this, you know, MDF program, which be like market, market development funds, um, in order to promote NVIDIA products and you know help us to communicate the value of nvidia to gamers which quite frankly a lot of the time is very true i mean nvidia cards do offer compelling value to gamers of course they do so do amd cards i was just going to say there's a lot on the <laughs> it's kind of deceptive saying that there's also a lot on the amd side yeah, especially in just raw games intel has a lot of value that needs to be communicated to gamers and they pay companies whether it's a retailer or a system builder these marketing funds in order to communicate that because intel doesn't have unlimited reach to every user who could possibly use a cpu they don't communicate directly they need someone like best buy to have you know intel inside stickers on those laptops you know they, they need that messaging they need that help and that's where money changes hands um, so it's not like this is completely unprecedented, a manufacturer giving money to someone who sells their products to sell them better. The, the, the problem here is just the way that it's been very awkwardly not denied and awkwardly made very public. And um, I, I'm actually going to go against you. I think it was more aggressive than that because they completely dropped the line. Well, yeah, and that's they, and the they problem. Didn't, and they didn't completely drop a line well, as in... Okay, hold on a second. Because not selling, not having AMD CPUs in your systems... But they have AMD CPUs. I know, and that is part of the problem. That's part of where I was that's going That's where I was just going. So, like, not having systems that have them and just, like, kind of not saying anything is like, okay, well, we have a strategic partnership with them. I mean, are, are we going to say that EVGA is anti-competitive because they don't sell AMD graphics cards? How about XFX? Anti-competitive because they don't make NVIDIA graphics cards? No, they just have strategic partnerships. The problem to me is the, the publicity. publicity. and denouncing. You know, yes. has, the second you say they suck because of X, that's denouncing and that's a problem. Yes. Saying we choose NVIDIA graphics cards for our systems because we find them very reliable is fine. Yes. Saying we choose to not have AMD graphics cards in our systems because we find them to be less reliable isn't fine, especially when you look at some of the data that's come out from other PC builders indicating, I saw one report that did have NVIDIA with, with an edge, but it wasn't like... You know, it's not worth like dropping them entirely for yeah. with no incentive. I, I did find the semi-accurate article, so apparently the the program is allegedly called Tier Zero, and um, it, the, I think there was an update on this article at some point that basically said the program is dead. So the program the program is over. So someone somewhere thought that this probably wasn't a good idea to keep going with, and I tend to agree with it. Um, speaking of Nvidia initiatives. Uh, da, 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 da. What are you looking for? I'm looking for the the Linux thing. No, I don't remember what I'm looking for. Oh no, they're they're get their game box thing, whatever it's called. That's the 4K not in gaming here, but the things. uh, it's not called Nvidia Box. Warbox. Oh. Warbox. I think Warbox? that's what it's called. So there's something Nvidia is doing lately that I actually think is kind of cool. They're selling Warbox certified. No, it's not. It's not Warbox. War. Someone in here. I'm just gonna look at Twitch chat. Yeah, someone's got to be telling us. So they're selling Battlebox. Battlebox. <laughs> uh, 4K certified gaming machines through selected partners. I think that's really cool. And it's not just through Origin, it's through other 
uh, through other gamer game PC makers as well. And the idea is just these are powerful enough for 4K gaming, so you, people know what they're getting into without necessarily researching all the specs. And a lot of people, uh, I saw the comments on that going, "Oh my God, you can just build this yourself." Blah, blah, blah. That's not who they're targeting. To be completely honest, they're not targeting yeah. you guys. They're targeting the not. people that are going to buy something from those system builders. Yes, which exactly. Which is probably not you. All right, so a GPU expert posted on the forum in response to one of the things we were talking about last week saying GK110 was never meant to be used in a GTX 680-like product. So this post ahem, is in direct response in which, etc. And you guys can go ahead and check it out. Definitely read it. Remember, we always post the, uh, the document on the Linus Tech Tips forum. So ahem, it has all this cache. It has compute accelerators. It has this. It has that. Um, another important point is it was never meant to compete with AMD's consumer Radeon line in 2012. It couldn't because the yields were so low it was impossible. So PC per calculated how much, etc, etc, etc. Okay, all of that's fine and good. That doesn't mean it was never intended to compete. The, so, the key words fair. there is the yields were not yeah. high enough to okay, be possible. Okay, the yields sucked and they couldn't do it. That doesn't mean it was never intended to be a GTX product. In fact, we see it's a GTX product now. If they could have achieved those yields back then, would they have done it? Maybe, maybe not, because they certainly didn't have to, and they were better off shipping much more lucrative Teslas. Um, so, okay, so a couple of things. Number one is one of the points in this post is because it was more of a compute-oriented design, it was therefore not intended for gaming. GTX 480, boom. If it ends in an 80. Compute oriented design gtx 480 was intended to be a geforce graphics card um, we have not yet seen a gpu from nvidia that has not made its way into a geforce graphics card at some point if they could do it sooner then great uh, number two was that uh, they needed all the cards for super for this for the titan supercomputer okay that doesn't that's that that doesn't mean that they never intended anything brings up the yield thing again if they yes. had more yield to be able to easily do that and do something else with that project then they might have done it okay so furthermore gk110 has error detection correct capabilities that would make it safer for workloads that rely on ecc okay well i mean they were moving towards more tesla and more quadro anyway um that that's not a new thing that's not a that's not a new direction for them that's not something that they weren't already talking about I mean, CUDA has been a thing for kind of a while uh, before this. Uh, next up, okay. The first GK110 based consumer product launch was GTX Titan. That's 13 months after AMD released the 7970. So even if NVIDIA had intended to use GK110 for GTX 680, it would have come out more than a year late after the competition, which is commercial suicide. Well, okay. Why didn't do it. Which is exactly why they're really lucky 7970 wasn't a lot better than it was. Uh, because it's not like this would be the first time, again, GTX 480, that NVIDIA would have been late on a product launch with a part that wasn't necessarily, you know, trimmed, fat trimmed, optimized for gaming, and that doesn't mean they never intended for GTX 480 to be a, great, a, G, a GeForce card. That doesn't mean they never intended for GK110 to be a GTX-based card. They've got the yields to the point now where they're delivering a 699 card, GTX 780. Which is like beast. And you look at the way their product stack worked. They, this was it was a reactionary move, making GK one hundred four fit everything from the four ninety nine price band all the way to the two forty nine price band. They've never done that before. That's never been part of their strategy. And you can quote me on this: it will never intentionally be part of their strategy again to position a mid range intended GPU against a top tier GPU from their competition. I don't believe that that is. The direction as as they that they've help moved in. As long as they can They might have it. low yields again at some point. Yeah, I mean, things happen. But that doesn't mean that GK110 was never intended to be GeForce, which is the... Or, okay, okay. And the headline was, never meant to be used in a GTX 680-like product. Like. I don't necessarily believe that either. Um, so anyway, there you go. I mean, I think it's been great for NVIDIA that they've been able to milk GK104 for so long. And it's great that they were be able to avoid the bloodbath they would have taken on selling these cards. But again, it's not like they've never taken a bloodbath on a top tier product before. It's not like they've never launched a vaporware product before. Six, because, I mean, again, another point made here was they wouldn't have even been able to ship many. Okay, how many 6800 Ultras do you think they shipped? It's not like a top tier product has never existed before that never really existed and so anyway that's my take on it maybe you're right maybe somewhere in a back room at nvidia from day one gk110 was not intended to be 
part of that family as the top tier product? I doubt it. We've, we've got a few comments of Linus, calm down, stop the ranting, a few things. So let's jump down to a thing you might not be so mad about. Let's go down to the gold-plated stuff. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> Are you sure we can't do Samsung Galaxy round? Well, let's, I could let's rant on just that for do that later. <laughs> we'll split up the topics a little bit. HTC introduces a gold HTC One. This was posted by Top War Gamer on the forum, and I want one. I think they made like five though, so I don't think I'm getting one. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then, go to the yeah. Costs uh, you can so it costs uh, roughly four thousand uh... dollars or something like that. But the uh, the Verge had a great uh, had a great thing that they brought up here as well, and that is that you can already get gold plated sites from gold or gold uh, gold plated phones from goldgenie.com anyway. So guys, we don't have an affiliate program with goldgenie.com. They have not given us any money for a sponsor spot here, so. Don't take this for anything that it isn't. But holy balls, that is so cool. You can get like Golf so many clubs, different things. Golf clubs, game consoles. A Wii. Gold plate your Wii. <laughs> Golden Wii. Yeah, I got Golden it. Wii. I, I, Golden Wii. Golden Wii. Yep. <laughs> we got there. Uh, mm. iPhone 5, iPhone 5 at best. I mean, this is uh, this is this is really really cool, and I I think that's neat. But and like, I'm sure if you contacted them, you could get pretty much whatever you wanted gold plated, considering their selection that they have. I think that's awesome. Uh, phone. Oh my goodness! Everything we have left, I'm gonna end up ranting about. So. I know. I think we just needed at least like a little bit of a break between the ranting. All right. Well, we're up again. Nvidia limits monitors to three, and we're going after Nvidia again here. This... Don't don't worry. I got some love for AMD coming up too. NVIDIA limits monitors to three in Limix. Li and Limix. Like, this th this is an artificial limit that they yes. shoved in that was not yeah. there before. So this was posted by Ichondo on the forum <sighs> and the original article's on PC Per, titled, Things That Make You Go Hmm, <laughs> NVIDIA Edition by Jeremy Hellstrom. So basically, what NVIDIA's done is they have taken a limitation that didn't exist already and they have unnaturally injected it into their their Linux drivers in order to not be showing preferential treatment to the Linux platform versus Windows because they only support three monitors on Windows. Specific quote, for feature parity between Windows and Linux, we set base mo mosaic to three screens. Like, what? Oh my god, you don't want to show preference? You hated Linux forever and gave them nothing. Screw you. Like, you could be nice for a second. What's wrong? God. So, um... Yeah, for few. I just all for... my rage. And, and, and I, it actually makes me so because when when Linus Torvalds was like, I'm not gonna take my finger away yet. I was like, oh, but they're finally helping them. You could probably do it. And I'm like, oh, you're more wise than I am. Okay. That and but that's not to say AMD is perfect either. So AMD has got a bit of a weird thing going on here, where they're in order to get HDMI audio carried over the DVI port. So using a DVI to HDMI adapter, you must use the AMD approved adapter that comes in your box. Or I mean, I don't even know where you would get one from <laughs> if it didn't come in your box, and you're just unfortunate. <laughs> um, because otherwise it won't carry audio. And that's not because there's something complicated. Remember guys, DVI to HDMI adapters are physical adapters, not signal adapters. There's no logic built into them. It's nope. pin to pin. Yep. Okay? Which means that the only reason that they are they are stripping the audio out by checking for for a module that's inside the adapter before it streams the audio out to it. What what do you stand to gain? Like, it just doesn't make, I, I would love to throw like a devil's advocate retort, but it's just like, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's not like, it's not like, you know, NVIDIA sells monitors. So they're, you know, they're, they would be preventing just, the, like, what? Why? <laughs> like, is there this huge new market in like DVI to HDMI adapters? I mean, <laughs> this to me leads into just a, a, a general discussion on artificial product segmentation that is something that I'm pretty passionate right, about. Right, because it's not on all their cards, is it? Uh, so, okay, no, this is, this, is, this is going somewhere. So, you know, things like Intel turning off certain functionality on some CPUs versus other ones to differentiate them. Well, no, this is a business skew. And this is not a business skew, and it's actually the same thing inside them. They're just turning things on and off. I mean, again, AMD is guilty of this too. The 7790, I actually asked this in my briefing. Um, well, because R260X 
is going to be a rebranded 7790 and it gets true audio support. Is 7790 going to get true audio support? And they kind of went, oh, well, we never thought of that. So I don't know if it's going to get it or not, but the, the, the hardware is there. It's a, it's a firmware update. Um, it's a rebrand. Yeah. So um, they, they could, in theory, enable it, but I, I suspect they won't, in much the same way that Intel never enabled trim on their X25Ms. I mean, I'm not trying to pick on anybody here. I'm just saying I don't like this practice. It makes me really uncomfortable. And it's, like, everywhere. Um, and, I mean, okay, I'll give AMD this, though. At least they are allowing cross-generational crossfire so far. Really? Someone tried 7970, I think it was Hardware Canucks, with R9280X. Well, people had 7970s showing up as R9280X in benchmarking programs. Like, they're literally rebranded, I know. But, <laughs> but NVIDIA has never allowed that in the past. Yes, that's so, why I said really. It was, so I was actually genuinely surprised. I'm trying to remember when the last one they outright rebranded was, and I think it was... Um, 8800 GTS... That? To um, GTS 250 or something like that. 88? No, 9800 GTX Plus to yeah. GTS 250. Okay, that would I be think, the most recent. I think, I think that was the most recent one they did, and they did not allow cross platform SLI in terms of the fact that, in, in spite of the fact that they were the same bloody cards. So at least AMD is allowing that. However, I don't know how long they're going to keep doing that because part of their crossfire trouble, I mean, is part of their crossfire trouble the fact that they allow. Different cards to be used. NVIDIA has always been very strict about it, and they've controlled the platform very carefully. Mm. Is that part of why they have less micro stutter? I don't know. I don't think so, because then if you had two of the exact same, it wouldn't be there. What wouldn't be there? The micro stutter. Yeah. So, yeah. like, I mean, because 7950 is allowed to crossfire with 7970, for example. If you have two different GPUs that can't even perform the same calculations at the then, same rate... Then I could see you possibly having the micro setter problem oh, that you just but in this case, But if you had two of the exact same... But that's... I mean, that's helpful for a very technical user, where you can explain, well, because this one's exactly the same as that, I mean, yeah, doesn't yeah, want to yeah, yeah. say that. But, but, but in all the benchmarks of people testing the crossfire yeah. issue, they're using the same ones. They're yes. not using... Oh, no, no, no. I'm not... I'm just saying that might have something to do... The way that their driver is written to allow that functionality okay. might not be helping. I don't know. Right. I don't have, I don't have in, inside knowledge of that. But I think in terms of messaging, if that ends up being a problem at some point, mixed to GPU crossfire... Um, maybe they will have to simplify and just say same GPU, same family, same RAM, go. So, I don't know. Um, I mean, I guess this is an opportunity to discuss rebadging in general. Maybe we should save it for next week, though, because I think we're running out of time. Um, we kind of are. Why don't we move that to next week? Mass transit directions have been added to Google Glass. We're just going to kind of burn through topics here, guys, uh, which I think is, is phenomenal. So you better not post it on the forum. The original article is from Engadget. I think this is one of the most useful things there could be about Google Glass between helping me get to where I need to go and being mounted to my head and telling me who people are that I meet because I'm not very good with names and faces. I would pay $1,000 for a Google Glass that has that functionality and reasonable battery life right now. So there you go. Since when did you become a baller? Um, well, I don't have $1,000, but it's also not available transit. right now. I take transit sometimes. When? I took it in Hawaii. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, I don't think you'd spend $1,000 on that. You never take transit. I've spent $1,000 on things that are important to me. No, never mind transit. Just in general, to having directions. I mean, using my phone like mounted to my dash, A, covers my speedometer, and B, <laughs> it like falls down all the time because I'm too cheap to buy a mount. It covers your speedometer? That's so bad. <laughs> At least the speedometer in my car works. <laughs> hey, mine does now. <laughs> uh, Samsung's curved smartphone gets pictured in leak and confirmed. So there's some good... This was pointed by You Better Not on the forum, and there's some good points from that Norwegian guy. You want to go ahead and field these? Okay. Um, so here, let's, let's see if we can pull up. There's, there's a picture. So that's what it looks like. It's curved. My, my favorite thing that that Norwegian guy brought up was the, the curved screen screen will inherently make it better at falls. Yeah, okay, might be less likely to get damaged, point. sure. Um, the pockets thing, I don't necessarily know if I agree with because some people are different sizes and that curve isn't going to be exactly the same. Yeah, so he said it'll, it'll be better for putting it in your pocket. I tend to disagree with that because I usually put my phone in screen away from my body. Because I've found that if you have thin material on your pockets, you can often accidentally activate things if you don't have your phone completely powered off, so that oh. can be a pain. Yeah, also if I have other things in my pocket, I usually make it screen away and then put everything behind it. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess I could change how I do that, but it's... So that would yeah. look really weird in your pocket. Yeah. 
Um, okay, uh, in theory, you could make tracking more accurate. I've, one thing that I'm bringing up that I don't think is in here, that it could make it a little bit easier for people with smaller hands to reach that top left corner. Yeah, no, I think that's in something there. Something flat. Uh, rest more comfortably and secure in your hand. Okay. Which well, could be a problem for people with small hands. Yeah, so so better better reach, uh, just being more comfortable, um, laying it down on your nightstand to wake it up. The tunnel shape could be focused towards your ear, making it louder to you. I don't know. There, that's if your speaker's front mounted, I guess. But. Yeah, that's true. There's some interesting functionality of if it's laying on a table, if you pull down on the one side, it'll show you any notifications you have at the time and the battery. Okay, so here's my problem. Okay, watch this. Boom. Okay, now what? Now I got this like weird curved screen that doesn't fit any better in my hands and doesn't enhance the experience in any way. I don't think it's anyway. that curved. It's pretty curved. Let's go back to the picture. I don't think it's so curved that it's going to be unusable. I don't know. It looks ridiculous to me. And the other thing that bothers me about it is the whole curved screen thing from an eye fatigue perspective is is supposed to be better because the screen is equidist from your eyes at all points and it's projecting light directly towards your eyes which should make it appear brighter and more vibrant um, but the issue for me with that then is again watching content sideways which is how i when particularly when i'm like enjoying content on my phone is usually how i'm using it i don't see this making that experience better in fact i see it making it worse i really i actually completely just i don't necessarily see it making it better i really don't see it making it worse or unusable i don't think it's curved that much and honestly if you're looking at it it's not like it's going to be curved and you're looking up into an overhang that you can't see like, you're okay. going to be able to see the whole screen. I'm no, you'll be able to see sure the whole that. screen. It's just, I think it'll look distorted. Hmm. I don't know. Because that's what causes a movie theater screen to not appear to be curved. It makes it appear to be a rectangle in front of you, is the fact that the curvature is designed so that you're looking yeah, at it naturally. Yeah. If you were to take that screen and turn it on its head, and then, I, I don't know. Okay, wait and see, I guess. Well, yeah. Yeah. Wait and see, but I'm not that sold. But then I would have said the same thing about the Steam it's, controller. And yeah, that's true. So I'm not that sold. I'm not necessarily going to run out and buy that phone. I'm just saying I don't necessarily think it's game-breaking. Uh, okay, and on tech, uh, some thoughts on smartphone region locking. This has been a bit of a hot-button topic with the Note 3. So Samsung has not only allowed carriers to lock the Note 3 to their networks, but they have actually locked it down region-wise, which flies in the face to me of the direction that the industry should be going and contrasts very starkly with what T-Mobile's doing, enabling yeah. worldwide roaming on their network with a reasonable cost. As a, and then Samsung's turning around and making it so the phones can't be, can't be unlocked in particular regions. So I, okay, so yes, a T-Mobile customer can still take their Note 3 with them when they're traveling, to be very clear. But what Samsung's really trying to do is prevent gray market sales. So, you know, the sale of unlocked phones will be, will be very region specific and you will be limited to getting a phone from your carrier. And if every carrier was progressive thinking and allowing you to buy unlocked phones without contracts at reasonable rates and all of that kind of stuff, then something like that would be fine. But otherwise, I think people are going to end up in a situation where they can't get a Note 3 for their region without signing a long contract, which is to me, again, the direction that things should be moving away from. We should be becoming more global, global cool. and less, less locked down. And this, to me, is just not the right way to go about this. I, like I even had, I read originally that that phone was region locked and then immediately after read that once you put an initial SIM in, yeah. that you could change it. But then if it's being locked down hardcore in multiple ways, once you put that SIM in, you're going to be screwed anyways. Yep. Yeah. So more more locking, I just feel, is very negative. And you know what? There's some discussion. I think it was on that post on Anontech about voting with your wallet not being meaningful. Um, I don't remember where I saw it, but it was when, in relation to this. And I totally disagree. I think voting with your wallet is incredibly important. The idea that one voice doesn't count is ridiculous. If, if I don't buy something and other people don't buy something, that's money that you took directly away from their potential revenue and gave it to a competitor. A large part of that was actually probably what I typed. And it wasn't, I actually do the same thing. I know you vote with your wallet. I also vote with my wallet. And I do agree that the one person thing is ridiculous because the one person thing isn't actually a one person thing. Yeah. It's hopefully everyone is doing this and it bundles a much larger, it makes it much bigger situation. What I was actually trying to say, I might not have typed it up very well, was that I don't think this is going to reach enough people. Right. Like, I, I don't think the scope will hit enough people yeah. to make the vote with your wallet Most thing. people will never like know. Yeah. And, I mean, Samsung's not doing the same thing on other models yet. So, yeah. 
there's still lots of alternatives within Samsung's own lineup that people can buy. Yeah, and, and another thing that I, I at so least won't suffer. hope that I typed in there was that within this article, there probably won't be enough people. But if we talk about it and other people talk about it and everyone starts talking to everyone else and it, it gets Xbox bigger. One. No, seriously, yeah. Yep. Once it gets big enough, voting with your wallet will definitely matter. And I just hope more people talk about it because just within that one article, I don't necessarily think it would have been enough people. Did I put that? I, I have no idea what that's doing in there. All right, do you want to do the uh, the forum update while I fire up the builds of the week? I think that got moved. That was supposed to be completely somewhere else. Um, anyways, <laughs> our overall active position for folding is now 76. We got We went up 10 spots from last week, which is ridiculous. I believe we're currently the fastest moving team in the world. Uh, we have 1,131 members right now. We gained 63 from last week, which is insane. Um, we have a new 4P folding member, um, Imaginarium, I believe is his name. So so we know Whaler has a few crazy machines 4P, running. to be clear, is four processors within a single system. Yeah, so we have a new guy running four processors. Redoing the one from last week because so many people didn't get it. Oh, okay. Um, anyways, yeah, so that's actually pretty awesome. Our Boink team is 11th in Canada and 310th in the world. So they're not doing quite as well, but still really well. They went up 22 spots worldwide since last week. So that's actually pretty awesome as well. And they have 123 members. All right. So build logs of the week, guys. Arctic water by B negative. Go. So this is actually the same machine we did last week, just because the stream was completely cut off and it's at the very end. We felt, or I felt at least, that a lot of people might have missed it, and I didn't want these guys to lose their spotlight, so we're doing it again. So this machine is just absolutely insane. There's a lot of raw copper, which I'm sure he coated so that it wouldn't get all messed up, but like you can actually see the copper, and he's painted things specifically copper, like the rings and different parts on the Sabertooth motherboard, and the tops of his RAM, and that little mesh bit right there, and just all this kind of stuff, and he actually opted to go with the, the default crossfire bridge which like no one <laughs> likes showing because it's usually ugly but it actually fits in this build and just it's just absolutely beautiful so that's built by b negative who's actually quite well known all right custom water cool desk by p baines also an absolutely beautiful build just looks incredible and like the amount of attention to detail that went to both of these was crazy this guy actually switched out all of his fluid at one point because he's like it wasn't quite exactly the kind of orange that I would have liked. So he got like a slightly different orange and like, oh, it's amazing. And something that I was worried about with this is these, these kind of taller desks, not like actually in height, but the, the where you put things on part, that part being taller, yeah, right there, uh, worries me, but it kind of fits him. And he did, as you can see, it kind of fits him fairly well. And he did say in the comment section of his insanely long, scary for bad internet connections build log because he has so many high res pictures that he's thinking about putting a little table extension thing for his right. keyboard and mouse anyways. That's so, cool. Yeah. I really like how he did like the the controllers there and the fan spots on the side and everything. It's really cool. Um, so this is something kind of interesting that most people won't have seen yet because we haven't started rolling it yet, but some of the build logs of the week of the past are actually featured in an upcoming pre-roll campaign on our videos. They're actually, you actually featured the individual build logs? So I, I was talking to Fractal about what we wanted to do for their Q4 campaign, and uh, Josh was like, okay, well, we could do this or we could do that. And I was like, yeah, we could. Or oh, here's an idea. Why don't, we, why don't we feature a product that our community loves? I think you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. <laughs> why don't we feature it in such a way that, you know, because I'm not going to say that the Define R4 is my favorite case. I'm not going to say that, even if, if it's a paid pre-roll, because it's not my favorite case. It's a great value. It's a great case. But the TJ07 is my favorite case. So Silverstone, I'll take that money now. <laughs> um, but the, what, what I wanted to say about it is, well, let's say something about the Define R4 that's true. And what we said was the Define R4 is featured in more build logs of the week on the WAN show than any other case. And yeah. I went back and checked, and it is. So the pre-roll actually contains some of these Define R4 cases in all their glory, cycling through it and then finishing with a nice shot of the Define R4 in its stock config. And it's just like, look, here's a message. Linus Tech Tips community loves Define R4. You guys do. We do. And I just thought it was kind of a neat way to, uh, to, to promote that oh, that's, product. That's really cool, because you had actually come to me asking... Um like what things have been featured, blah, 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 because I remember the start of that, but I had never heard the end where we're actually filled, featuring the individual builds. And they're, we're, sure we're crediting them, by the way. 
That's. I was just gonna say. Yeah. They'll have their I'm, forum I'm sure handles. they'll like it if they're called out yep. as well. So there's pictures of their builds. Um, Ed's will picked kind of a, a top picture of each build and then put the uh, the forum handle of whoever built it underneath, nice. which nice. I I think is gonna be kind of cool for those folks to see that. So so there you go, guys. That's actually pretty awesome. I think that's pretty much it for the WAN show this week. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy lives to tune in and listen to us talk about technology. I hope you enjoyed our special guest, Total Biscuit, and our hats that uh, went along with... I have one of them. Yours went flying, I think. Our special guest. Where did it go? Let us know you if go. you think we should wear these hats every week. I certainly think we should. Mine doesn't fit. And uh, peace out, brothers. Bye.